Hello, everyone. Welcome to another episode of This Week in Science. We're doing our live broadcast. Justin, how did you get such a fancy red cup? That's like the classic, the classic party cup, yet not. For wine drinkers. For wine it's, drinkers. Uh, it's for wine drinkers <laughs> at the party. Okay. Yeah. It's a California thing. You won't find a disposable red uh, wine glass everywhere. <laughs> Uh, in America, but in California, <laughs> where we have a rich tradition of, of uh, vinerology? I don't even know what it's called. Viticulture. Viticulture the, and language. enology. And mm -hmm. colleges. And, so and colleges, yes. Oh, everyone, it is time to begin the show. And you know how this goes. We're going to do the podcast, because that's what we do here. We're going to do all the science. We're going to go on and on, hopefully make it a tight 90, but you know, we don't do that all the time, so there will probably be some edits for the final podcast. Uh, you ready for this, co-hosts? Yeah, let's do all it. Right. Let's do a show, everyone. We're so glad you're here. Okay, starting in a three, a two, this is twist this week in science episode number 850 recorded on wednesday november 10th 2021 talking science on world science day hey everyone i'm dr kiki and tonight on the show we will fill your heads with sewage ski wax and some worms but first disclaimer 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 we all know what is actually driving global warming. As the climate summit continues in Scotland, key provisions were put forth to make real changes in auto emissions. A declarative pinky promise statement was written and proposed for governments and manufacturers and investors to sign. And all it stated is that they would work towards all sales of new vehicles and vans being zero emissions by no later than 2035 in leading markets. 23 countries bravely signed the pledge to do something in the direction of change in the next 15, 20 years -ish or so. Absent from the list of the signees, all of the countries who mass produce cars, Japan, Germany, China, South Korea, and the United States did not sign a pledge to even move in the right direction with a deadline. Meanwhile, some auto manufacturers actually did sign it. General Motors, Ford, Mercedes-Benz, and Volvo, but no other automakers. Okay, Jaguar signed it too, but no other actual real automakers signed it. Partly perhaps because making an electric car would require too much investment in research and development, take too long to get to market by the 14 year deadline, and might be poorly received by the car buying public. Tesla, of course, didn't need to sign because they already make electric vehicles that they started from scratch making about 12 years ago, which have been enthusiastically received by the car buying public to become a company valued more than all of the other car companies put together. Before all the excuses are pushed aside, before the lobbyists have gone to bed, before the leaders jibber jabbering double speak fall silent, Hopefully, before the canary in the coal mine is an actual canary on a submerged tropical island clinging to a lone branch sticking out in the middle of the ocean, the real solutions for what we need to do will be found right here on This Week in Science, coming up next. I've got the kind of mind that can't get enough. I want to learn everything. I want to fill it all up with new discoveries. To you, Kiki and Blair. And a good science to you too, Justin, Blair, and everyone out there. Welcome to another episode of This Week in Science. We are back again. Another week. And it just so happens that this show, this science show, is happening on World Science Day. What? Ooh, it's World Science Day. 
one day? Peace. They just have one day for science? <laughs> yeah. Just one. It is World Science Day for Peace and Development. And it is a, a day that is meant to highlight the significant role of science in society. I think we do that every week. And the need to engage the wider public in, a, in debates on emerging scientific issues. I think we try and do that with our audience here on a weekly basis. It also underlines the importance and relevance of science in our daily lives. Hmm. Again, it's what we do here. We get to celebrate world science every single week on Wednesdays. It's World Science Week here, 52 weeks out of the year. Pretty much. Pretty much. I mean, I'm glad that the UN and everybody else out there in the world catches up with us occasionally. But here we are, and we have all sorts of science for the week. I have stories about um, taking, taking tiny, tiny specific looks at proteins. Looking at proteins. Mm. And I am also sounding the alarm. Well, I'm not sounding the alarm. Some little insects are. And I've got a bunch of brainy news for the end of the show. Depression, differences, pain. It's all positive. You know, I'm just teasing you out. Y'all want to stick around for the end of the show brains. (gasps) Justin, what is in... I've got a I've got a rare just good news tech edition. Mm, tech edition. Okay. It's a tech edition. It's a, a technology thing that's just good news. Uh, I've got a why humanity is disgusting story. Uh, <laughs> tools to research humanity's past, as well as uh, why you need to move out of Florida and Louisiana if you didn't already think you had a good enough reason. I'm going to give you two good reasons. I hear the engines revving out there. Someone's getting out of there right now. Yeah, I'm, I'm actually uh, broadcasting from a drag race uh, course right now. <laughs> very good. Very good. Blair, what's in the animal corner? Oh, my goodness. Um, why skiing will destroy the environment. I also have um, a story about uh, penis worms and how they're the original hermit crabs. And of course, I have fish rubbing. Yeah. <laughs> so, fish rubbing? Yeah. Fish rubbing. Okay. Well, you know. Hey, yeah. I'm going to say, at some point, I'll just stop being surprised. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's been almost a decade. Yeah. Uh, of things like penis worms and fish rubbings. Yeah. Okie dokie. We're going to dive into this show. But before we do, I want to remind you that if you are not yet subscribed, you can subscribe to us on YouTube, on Facebook, on Twitch. We're Twist Science over there on, on Twitch. We are on Instagram. We are on Twitter. We're also, we're, we're all over the place on the podcast directories. Look for This Week in Science. That's how you find us pretty much everywhere. And you can find our website at twist.org. But now it's time for the science. Okay, let's talk about bias. We're going to talk about bias in science. In an area that you probably weren't thinking that there would be much bias. Telescopes. I'm not talking about uh, diversity, diversity, equity, inclusion. I'm not talking about social justice. I'm not talking about, I'm talking about the way that telescopes look at the plane of the Milky Way and the way that telescopes are able to see or not see through dust in the Milky Way. Um, Researchers have never been able to detect black holes more massive than 20 times the mass of the sun. There is a, and I think I've mentioned it before on the show, there are what's called, there is what's called a stellar graveyard of solar masses. There's a place at which we just can't find anything. We can't get past it. And hypothetically, we should be able to. Hypothetically, if... Hmm. Stars are exploding and turning into black holes. Then black holes merge with each other and more and more mergers happen. We should be able to see these big giant mass black holes with lots of gravitational pull. Like we should be able to 
see them and see what's going on. But we're not. We're not seeing anything of over 20 solar masses. So what's going on? Well, some researchers uh, were recent, recently doing an analysis, and they have determined that when black when black holes are formed from stars that are the size to go supernova the force of the supernova jolts the black hole and that black hole can move and the material around the black hole can actually be pushed out of the plane of the milky way however when a black hole is so big it just implodes on itself that implosion doesn't lead to the same forces that the supernova does. And so these giant black holes aren't getting bounced around and they're all they are sitting in the plane of the Milky Way in which we're sitting and they're surrounded by dust and gases that we can't see through with our telescopes. So they think that with telescopes like the John Webb uh the James Webb Space Telescope that is set to be launching here very soon hopefully December-ish. We'll see if that happens. Um, but that space telescopes that see in the infrared would potentially be able to see past the dust and the gas that's in the way. And we might be able to actually test this hypothesis that there are these larger black holes out there. They just, but these are we just can't see them because our telescopes well, are biased toward things that are visible. Okay, so but th this is uh, confusing me a little bit. So these are black holes within the uh, the uh, the the galaxy. Yes, within okay. within because the galaxy. We've, we've discovered there are discoveries of black holes much more billions of times, yes. billions Sorry. of solar yes. masses. Okay, yes. yeah, just want to make yes. clear. There are giant black holes outside of our galaxy. Ultra within massive, our galaxy. billions no. of solar masses <laughs> yeah. out there that have yeah. been discovered. But yes, uh, within uh, our galaxy, uh, there's a limit based on this not being able to penetrate through uh, through dust. Or something. Okay. Yeah. Thank you for clarifying on that. Yes. Yes. Well, because so it made me like it made me think. Every once in a while, when anything comes to cosmology and physics, there's a point where I'm like, "Oh gosh, you mean that you just theoretically?" believe that these things exist based on probably gravitational movements of a solar system that's right. a billion, zillion, trillion light years away, whatever. Right, okay. Okay, that makes more sense. <laughs> Sorry to have confused you. I probably confused more people out there too who are like, wait a minute, we've seen these things. Yes. But this stellar graveyard, it's like a gap in our knowledge um, in, our, in our galaxy. But it shouldn't be a gap. But it's probably just because our tools have not been appropriate for being able to see the things that we want to see. You can't see it until you can see it. Mm -hmm. Right? Yeah. So anyway, there's a lot, lot riding on the James Webb. Um, we hope that it launches and actually works. Yeah. So, yes, it will be coming. It will be coming. Justin, what'd you bring? Just good news, everybody. Tech Ooh. edition. Uh, engineers at Lancaster University working with the Josef Stefan Institute in Slovenia have successfully transferred digitally encoded information wirelessly. That's not new, you say? They used fast neutrons instead of electromagnetic radiation used by cell phones, radio, and Wi-Fi systems. So they used these fast neutrons and all of their transmission tests provided, uh, proved to be 100% successful. It just worked, and they're like really ecstatic about this, of course. Uh, fast neurons, and neurons, neutrons have an advantage over conventional electromagnetic waves, they say, uh, because of the traditional conventional electromagnetic waves that we use, those frequencies are significantly weakened by transmission through materials, uh, especially metals. This could allow cell and Wi-Fi signals to reach places currently that may have issues such as deep underground. You've probably experienced it in a parking structure. Uh, maybe you work at a bank and you're in the vault and you lose cell signal. But you can also just within a home be on the wrong side of a thick wall, a concrete wall, maybe you don't get to Wi-Fi out into the garage. So this could be a solution to that. Uh, may even be able to open up in the future the digital spectrum that we're using, which is continually being congested where we've got all these different electromagnetic signals and you have to have these 
frequencies and widths of band that are available by creating a new fast lane in wireless communications by utilizing this. They also hint that it could be used in materials uh, checking, like uh, testing bulkheads of ships, maybe the propellers of an airplane kind of a thing where you can go in and, and test those materials the, the way we do now, looking for defects and that sort of thing uh, that we currently use electromagnetic radiation for. Uh, research is, the researchers source the fast uh, neutrons from Californium-252, which is a radioactive isotope produced in nuclear reactors, making, uh, making the waste from a nuclear, spent nuclear fuel, potential material for our future electronics. So that's good news. Nuclear waste? <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. So <laughs> nuclear waste. I was waiting for the catch there for the yeah. just good news. No, it's just good news. I mean, if you think about it, we, we keep talking about all these bandwidth issues and there's so many digital frequencies that are out there now. And we're, we're like, oh gosh, you got these. And then how do you maintain all of these these little bandwidths of energy? If you have this other one that's using a completely different transfer system, uh, penetrates the wall, so you won't have that 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 weak spot in the uh, the the other side of the garage on your cell signal, or if you work in a large building or whatever it may be, uh, these will penetrate through the walls and and that sort of thing. Uh, and they're and they're apparently very efficient. And they may also be able to be used coupled with traditional signal so that you could have both operating at the same time. And that sounds like it would be useful. Yeah. Yeah. yeah just so get you get mul more multiband kind of data. Yeah. And it also could work as a confirmation bias if you're doing a very sensitive data transfer or something like this. So there's, there's a bunch of uses potentially for it. And, uh, and you know, we, we keep running into these material shortages all over. We have plenty of nuclear waste around. Plenty. You can just pop those in your cell phone. You'll be fine. Yeah, right. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Everybody wants some nuclear waste in their cell phone. Yeah, they did. They did right uh, up my face. Well, so <laughs> it's good for so the, the skin. <laughs> so the thing they point out, you're glowing. Uh, there somewhere <laughs> in this study is that the uh, the frequency, the rate of, that they were using the signal itself uh, was not harmful. Um, there may still be an issue. They don't go into it, of course, but in the materials that are being used to produce. Uh, but uh, yeah, it's a future people problem. And people are really good at solving problems. So it'll be fine. Oh, yeah. Got to go restart the router. Let me get fully suited up. <laughs> Open up the concrete box. <laughs> I don't want to do it. <laughs> We're not going to do it that way. Okay, Blair. Yes. Where do you want to take us now? Uh, here's my own just good news, I suppose. Bla Blair's good news. I don't know. I, my name doesn't do the same thing. Um, we were talking last week about how skiing is ruining, or oh, so how skiing is going to go away. Going right? to go away. It's You're going to have to learn how to ride a mountain bike. Yeah, if you yeah, like that's great because skiing is actually really bad for the planet. Um, this is from what? the Norwegian University of Science and Technology. It turns out that ski wax is releasing fluorine containing compounds called PFAS into the environment. Mm -hmm. Now, I just saw shameless, this is not an intentional plug, just this is where I saw it. There's an awesome um, piece on PFAS on. Um, uh, John, Oliver. John Oliver recently talking about the, these um, environmental toxins and how they impact humans. Well, so that was coming from things like Teflon, pipe coatings, other things that are in our lives. Um, uh, this the, yeah, is... interior of all packaging, basically. Yeah, like, yeah, 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 like yeah, 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 yeah. So it's also in ski wax. And so in Norway, it's getting into the soil and into... Mm -hmm the worms it's ending up in the environment and it's getting eaten by animals and so by ingesting PFAS the voles in that area had high levels of PFAS in their bodies from eating the earthworms along with high levels of neurotransmitter of the of, of dopamine in their brains they also had low levels of testosterone so then they took some mice they fed them some high PFAS in the lab and they found out that half of that was true. Uh, 
the PFOS was indeed causing dopamine problems. The dopamine system was affected in mice receiving PFOS in the lab, but there were no changes to testosterone. <laughs> so uh, they were able through this long, very interesting study. They found out this PFOS is impacting rodents. It's a problem. It also potentially is messing with their livers. It's giving them enlarged livers, which is really interesting. They don't mm -hmm. know exactly why that is. Um, but they know that these things could have serious consequences. What's interesting is they think there's actually a different environmental toxin causing the testosterone changes. <laughs> Oh, wow. Um, oh, so there's more they, than one. Yeah. So there's something else going on, too. The PFOS is causing the liver and the dopamine problems, but there's something else causing the testosterone problems. So the, the soil is just all messed up. Um, <laughs> but ultimately, uh, this can have behavioral problems if the dopamine system is messed with so could lead to disturbances in fear and anxiety thermoregulatory processes the ability for them to protect themselves their ability to um, woo and reproduce it also can cause mood swings and ca yeah. can cause motor and cognitive challenges so all that to say all this these chemicals that people put on their skis they are chemicals this wax it's not pure beeswax <laughs> there's other stuff in it yeah. That is going to end up in the environment if you're skiing. So that, that's something to keep in mind. And then immediately I was thinking about surfboard wax. They're all natural surfboard waxes out there, but not all of them are, I'd be willing to bet. So this is a good reminder that whenever you're spreading a chemical onto something and going into the environment, it ends up in the environment. <laughs> yeah. yeah. The other thing, it's, it's, it's already in everybody's blood, right? This is one the of the PFAS, things. That, yeah. The PFAS. It's already yeah. in everybody's blood. Mm -hmm. There's like, you. they had to actually, to get a sample of blood to compare, they had to go and I think they had like frozen uh, Korean War veteran, like <laughs> yes. blood samples. Yeah. That before were taken. plastics were available, before yeah. we were lining cans with this material. And, yeah. Yeah. and that was the only clean sample they could find. Yeah. Yep. In in human populations that didn't have this in there it's, uh, to some degree. Yeah, and I think that's a good reminder that this isn't just affecting voles and mice. Any chemicals we put into the environment eventually comes back to us. We're not isolated. So it, we need to remember, yeah, it's the, the things we put into the environment come back to us because we're part of the environment. And when we, I mean, there are chemicals in everything, right? There are chemicals in the environment, there's chemicals, 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 but we are creating chemicals through our chemical industry that are, have been separate kind of in this own little world that aren't, they were derived separately from an involvement in nature. They weren't like, oh, this is great. No, this, for this is completely man-made. <laughs> We've, we've synthesized things. It's like, oh, look yeah. what that does. That's great. Let's use it for that. Not knowing at all what these compounds uh, can or would get up to. So well, as we there move was, to the future. There was actually, uh, it was, I mean, we're talking about a thing that's not in this story, but uh, there were industry reports that were warning about yes. that from the researchers working for these companies that were like, hey, uh, hey you we know, should Flory, be very careful this be, with this yeah. thing that we created, not to let it get into the environment and the researchers were ignored because there was corporate interests. Yes. Huh. Well, hmm, Twist didn't exist yet to interpret the scientific studies that came out. So, you know, we're, we're, here, we're here now. now. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank goodness we are here now to interpret yes. these things. Other things that need to be interpreted are our entire bodies, the things that make up our bodies. Justin, you've done a lot of work on the uh, with like the nanopore DNA sequencing and or a bit of work in your in your genetics work sure, with sure. some of the new DNA sequencing technologies. Um, and the nanopore stuff is really amazing because it's these little basically a pore. It's a space that allows it's a it's an ionized space that allows like a single base from DNA to go through it to be read. Oh, when it passes through the electrical signal that gets the charge that goes past through the pore, you go, oh, that's a, you know, a, a guanine. Oh, that's a thymine. 
you know, you can identify what it is. And it's been amazing at revolutionizing the speed at which we're able to sequence DNA and see sequences of DNA, what they're what they're made up of. So some speed researchers and, speed and the length. It's also and able length, to do yeah. much longer Long. reads uh, with a, a decent degree of uh, reliability. Yeah. So it's great reliability. Right. And speed. And so it's making a lot of the sequencing work that we're doing very efficient. Um, researchers in from TU Delft and the University of Illinois have adjusted it very slightly so that the technology doesn't read DNA in this new incarnation, but rather protein Proteins. sequences. Yeah, so uh, what they have done is shown a proof of concept and read a single protein molecule. So basically the string of uh, amino acids that make up a protein and uh, have been able to read the electrical signals and identify. They, they have shown that they are able to identify single base mutations within mm -hmm single amino acid mutations within the protein sequences. And what this means is that it could lead to an ability to uh, read our proteomes, that this will allow us to really identify the proteins that are active within our cells at any moment in time, hmm. which is a huge question of interest because we don't know. We know that things happen environmentally you know, our bodies change, stressors, whatever, and that leads to a cascade of events that lead to protein transcription within the cell. Proteins get created and the proteins cause certain functions to happen. And yeah. what are all the proteins that are involved? Yeah. Protein, How are they working? Are, what, are the, what do those proteins look like? They're doing all of the work. They are yeah. all of the how stuff is taking place within, uh, within the cell. And so... Or within, throughout the body. And so it is one of these weird things where we think we have learned so much about anatomy and, you know, medicine and all this. But all we really have ever had is a very high altitude overview of cause and effect. Right. <laughs> you know, like really, we, we really, really, the mechanics of everything and the level that it's taking place is this proteomic level. And we have ideas generally about what's happening, but we don't have a high definition view of it that allows us to identify so much of this field. It really is just at the beginning of being open. If you're like, oh, I don't want to research medicine, human anatomy, they've already figured out you got a heart and a lung, two lungs actually they found, <laughs> and then there's like a liver over there. There's so many more layers to the point where we're really only breaching the subject. Yep. Yeah, the controls and the processes, how everything works within our cells is there's so much still to be learned. And this tool could become incredibly useful in the same way that the nanopore technology has opened up uh, DNA sequencing to so much investigation uh, yeah. in recent years. And the other thing that we're, we're likely to learn from this is 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 going to be probably a little bit disturbing. <laughs> Oh, yeah? <laughs> yeah, it's that uh, whatever the rules are, whatever the construct is that we've built for how biology works, it's going to be biology, which means, like you're saying, you can identify this, uh, this at the nucleic acid uh, mutate, uh, difference between one mm -hmm. protein or a change over time or something like that. That's actually taking place all the time everywhere in the body because it's biology which means even all of the things that we learn are tied to the fact that we saw it once or twice or generally accept that this is what's happening and this is what's taking place but on the biological level things are always changing yep differences are always taking place from one human to another the cells the those protein structures might be slightly different and so how does that affect human health how does that affect an immune system how does it affect the upper scale echelons right. of categories it's uh an intense field that again if you haven't picked the thing to study and you kind of like eh, maybe biology but this is like an incredible cell biology is going to be an exploding field over the next decades i believe
It's absolutely going to be. And yes, to answer R and Laura's question, it means they can detect a a single nucleotide variant. So they can detect when, um, well, not a nucleotide. They're not down to nucleotides. It's amino acids. Amino acids are down are combinations of usually com made from combinations of three nucleotides from mm -hmm. DNA. So when proteins are transcribed and translated, you have the DNA, which has the nucleotides. The nucleotides are then transcribed, copied via RNA. That RNA is a sequence of three opposite nucleotides to the DNA sequence and or I guess their their partner nucleotides, yeah. the complementary nucleotides. The R mRNA that comes from that gets transferred to the ribosome. The ribosome then turns each group of three nucleotides into an amino acid because it's like our it's like our Morse code or it's our, you know, it's our it's our code book. There are combinations of nucleotides that code for specific amino acids. And this technology does will not identify nucleotide mutations, but will identify amino acid changes, which is still important because that means that there's been mutation and that there's been a change somewhere along the line. So, yes. Okay. And you have a science question related to that someday. If you have science questions, everyone, you can send us science questions. <laughs> we do like them. Justin, what's your next story? Uh, oh, I don't know which one I actually have queued up next. Let's see. Oh, yeah. Humans are disgusting, according to researchers <laughs> at the University of California, Santa Barbara, with the uh, Columbia Climate School. They published in the Open Access Journal Plus One a high-resolution map of nitrogen and pathogens released into coastal ecosystems from human wastewater. Uh, to capture the impact of human sewage on coastal systems, these researchers mapped uh, estimated nitrogen and pathogen inputs, and that's outputs from land, inputs into the ocean, uh, from sewage of about 135,000 watersheds around the world, resolution of about a kilometer. The assessment employed newly available high-resolution data on global human populations, modeled how wastewater plumes entering the ocean would overlap in different ecosystems, of the watersheds that appear to release the most nitrogen from sewage, most are located in India, Korea, and China, with the Changjiang River contributing 11% of the global total. Well, that's more than 11% of the humans in China, so that kind of figures. Uh, the researchers also identified hot spots for coral reef exposure to nitrogen in China, Kenya, Haiti, India, and Yemen. Seagrass exposure hot spots and Ghana, Kuwait, India, Nigeria, and China. Seagrass being a foundational coastal habitat, uh, many parts of the world, not kind of important, re very important to the health of a coastal system. Uh, when If they go away also, then the erosion tends to scale up. Uh, from the authors, they're saying, the sheer scale of how much wastewater is impacting coastal ecosystems worldwide is staggering. But because we map wastewater inputs in the oceans across more than 130,000 watersheds, our results identify target priority areas to help marine conservation groups, public health officials to work together and reduce the impacts of wastewater on coastal waters across the planet. There is a map. There is a map that uh, we've got up there that you can kind of see. And you can always zoom in that map too to find out if your local coastal area uh, is imbued with quite a bit. You're, you're looking off the coast of Africa. There, you can find a little, a few hot spots here and there. Uh, go, go. If you look at uh, the water surrounding Manhattan, or off the coast of Louisiana, like there's some really. Oh, Baltimore Harbor. Do not go into harbor water. No, stay away. It's, I feel uh, like this is this should be one of those horror movie. Pr promos where it's like ding, don't ding, ding. go in the water yeah there's don't go in the water uh because it turns out the water you know the world may be your oyster young man or woman or, uh but it's also everyone's toilet so we should learn how to manage Thanks. how and what we flush into it a little better as, as long as we've all agreed maybe by default that the ocean is going to be our toilet and, and to, to be fair, 
It is the fascinating ocean. looking at the map though. It's it's really interesting to look across the coastline and it's mm -hmm. like every uh what would be uh, an outlet for every river and stream system, which are probably mm. which are used across the country as uh, sewage eff effluents here in Portland. All of our sewage, especially if the uh, the water, uh, if it rains a lot, the su the sewage gets overflowed, and the overflow is into the river, and the that's going to head out to the Pacific Ocean. Mm. Um, and that's pretty much everywhere. But fascinating. Sorry, what were you going to say? Oh, yeah, uh, I don't know. I don't think I had anything else, else to say, but it's, oh, gosh, off the coast of Los Angeles. Yeah, that's that's looking rough. L.A., you got some trouble down there. Yeah, <laughs> Take care I mean, of your... <laughs> don't go to the beach. Stay out of the water on the beaches. It's... <laughs> San really... Francisco Bay, not looking great. <laughs> Bay is not a place you want to fall into. Not looking as bad as uh, L.A. outside of the Bay, but the Bay yeah. is not. And what's sort of interesting, too, about it. agriculture runoff as well. It's not just going to be sewage because you've also got fertilizers and okay. a lot of the ag industry that's going to be Correct. adding to this. So for the uh, global output, at least, uh, about 32% of it uh, was from agriculture. The rest is human sewage and waste. Uh, so it's They're mostly right. us. It's mostly, I mean, it's all us, actually. It's 100% us. But, and I, I think, you know, I think overall, uh, it's not an issue of the ocean not being able to handle uh, nitrogen. Uh, the, the big issue is that we're just dropping it on the coast. Yeah. And it's, yeah. you know, that that's uh, our, our coastal habitats is where, you know, is, is, is going to absorb uh, less than it's going to disperse. So maybe just we need longer pipes to go out further into the ocean. I don't know. <laughs> so I'm, I'm, seeing, I'm seeing two things on this map. So one is there's obviously in highly populated areas, there's some bright mm -hmm. green, there's some toxic green. But <laughs> um, the other thing that's really important is topography and uh, fluid dynamics in those spaces. Yeah. So the reason yeah, that the sure. San Francisco Bay looks like the way it does is because it's basically the bathtub drain for the entire watershed. Central Valley. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So it's it's the entire all the water coming down from the Sierra Nevadas from three directions collects there. So uh, of course but... <laughs> it's all going to collect right there, right? Yeah. And it does. Yeah. The bay does a really good job of filtering through all of that, which is why you don't see it on the outside. So it's also a good reminder, aside from just knowing that populated areas are gross, uh, that when we consider our pollution of all sorts, that the dynamics of the topography of the space should be considered because it's going to go where it's going to go. Right. Yeah. And it's, that's what this modeling tool is designed to help with so that you can, you can see where, you know, you have a, uh, you have collection areas or high density areas that you can I don't know, either mitigate uh, on land or just monitor, uh, you know, on those coastal areas to make sure that it's not having uh, too negative of an effect because it's gonna, I mean, have it, some kind of a negative effect. Uh, yeah, oh, yeah. Humans, I, love, humans, I love scrolling around maps. I could do this all you, night. If it's you very consider, calming. if you consider the <laughs> land on the Earth uh, and all of the creatures upon it, and and then see that it is uh, basically lined with a bathtub ring of sewage from one species. It's yep. kind of actually impressive what we've done. To the nice earth. work, humanity. <laughs> <laughs> Left our mark, literally. Yeah. <laughs> Not the way I wanted to. Oh, my goodness. But uh, there are other things that leave their marks as well. And you have to sound the alarm to ensure that uh, they, they don't have a terrible effect before it happens. There is a, a specific alarm sound that I'm going to play right now for you. This is the sound. Uh, 
danger in the hive. Very upset. It's a grumpy bee. Very grumpy. This is a beehive. It's a uh, honey beehive, Apis serrana, from a, uh, a beehive where uh, in in Asia, Vietnam, where the um, murder hornet uh, or originated, and this giant hornet, Vespa soror, the scientific name has uh, invaded North America, but the bees here don't have any adaptations to uh, to defend their hives. This particular uh, group of honeybees has developed, we talked previously about the ability of smearing mud on their hives to uh, mask the scent of the hives to protect it from the uh, from these giant hornets. And uh, this new study, these researchers from Wellesley College have published in Royal Society Open Science, their study of, uh, of a hive colony that they have detailed this harsh, irregular, shifting frequency call that is, uh, that is unique to the response to this hornet specifically. So the the honeybee has adapted a new response in Asia, in Vietnam, to uh, rev the colony up to bring honeybees to the doorway of the hive so that those honeybees can start increasing the temperature locally, blocking the entrance, mm. spreading mud on the entrance. So the, the amplified call is like the Time to go to battle. We must oh, or get or get up, to yeah. our defenses. Yes. Yeah. We still got the graphic up from the. Oh, from sorry the about that. Sewage story. No worries. Thank you. Um, yeah, it's, it'll be, well, bees are. All, we keep more. We find out about bees. They're just great communicators. Amazing communicators. Yeah. I wish I could communicate as well as some of these honeybees. Some days, sometimes, sometimes it doesn't come across quite so clearly. But I hope. I do hope. That we're coming across loud and clear right here. This is This Week in Science. Thank you so much for joining us for another episode of The Science. If you are enjoying the show, please be sure to tell a friend. And head on over to twist.org and get yourself a new 2022 Twist calendar. There's Animal Corner calendar. They are available now. Twist.org. Click on the toad. Order your calendar today. It's time for our COVID update. <laughs> yes. All right. Let's boopity boop into a question that has been posed by many people. The idea of whether or not COVID is seasonal. Will it become seasonal? What's going on? Well, there's a new uh, a new article on thescientist.com uh, looking at, into a lot of the research that has gone on. And really, it the, the evidence isn't clear. It doesn't appear to be so very seasonal in nature. It is affected by temperature and humidity to some degree or another. And that does seem to affect it. But really, the larger effect comes from human behavior. Mm -hmm. And so the take-home message is that it may yet become a seasonal virus, a seasonal disease similar to the flu that is a virus of the winter, at least especially for northern hemisphere countries uh, and or countries that are closer to the poles. But uh, really, it, as the virus becomes endemic, it, it, it really depends on treatments, vaccines, human behavior, and uh, what happens to the pockets of the virus as uh, it becomes just around all the time. So one of the things that's also about seasonal uh, outbreak is that it has, it's not like, oh, gosh. Uh oh! Hey, it's winter now. You know the cold virus is uh, it's more active. Going to get out of the house a little bit more. 
it's because these are times you're like, we're going to see a spike uh, post Thanksgiving, post Christmas. We're going to see a spike when as families and groups of people get together in close quarters and break bread and tell each other that they, <coughs> they love each <coughs> love you. <coughs> very, very, <coughs> it's great seeing you again. And they're coughing on each other and they're sneezing on each other. And then malls, this is the thing I always bring up because I find it fascinating. Malls, which isn't as big a thing anymore as it used to be. People still go to them for the shopping season. They're not heated in the winter. It's just the humans walking through. They just turn off the air circulation in the winter in these big mall buildings because the humans walking around actually are enough to warm it up. But that also means you have uh, congested airspace with lots of humans in it. This is mm. part of what seasonal uh, outbreak is about. It's about people who are no longer distanced. Uh, so we're going to continue to see continual infection as well as uh, seasonal spikes. It's, it's actually both. <laughs> it's, I've taken, instead of just saying like, oh, now that COVID's getting better or once COVID's over, I just, I, now instead I say, now that COVID has become endemic. <laughs> yes. And that, and that's the key because it's not going away. And uh, I just was reading some, uh, some tweets today from uh, um, Andy Slavitt, who used to work with the White House and uh, is, has been doing some great science communication work with respect to the, to, to the pandemic. And he said, you know, bunch of people are saying the pandemic is over like smart people on media are saying the pandemic's over it's not over and it even though you might be vaccinated your local community may have very little spread there are still pockets there are still places around the country around the world where pan where where the virus is still very much a problem across the united states we are still seeing uh you know 1500 deaths a day we are seeing uh numerous coast uh, cases the uh, the Central Valley in California uh, is experiencing an increase in cases, which is a concern. There are there are, there is a concern among epidemiologists as to what's going to happen over the holidays. But all you can do right now is keep it just you know mm -hmm. be aware, be compassionate, be aware, and don't rub the pandemic being over in people's faces because it's not over yet, mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. it may or may not become seasonal. It all depends on us. It depends on on the least of us, uh, the <laughs> right. least the the least willing to follow guidelines and do social distancing. Took the yeah. kids to the zoo. This is a personal story. Took the kids to the zoo the other day because they had dinosaur exhibit, which was really fun. Plus, it's the zoo, which is always awesome. And there's a you know you have to wear the mask at the zoo. Uh, dozens of parents out there not wearing their masks. Mm -hmm. These are the people within our society who are going to make this uh, endemic and these spikes and the rest of this because there's people who just don't get rules <laughs> that are in their own Go interest on. even. I mean. Throw your trash in the garbage can, people. Come on. Yeah, Throw don't you litter, you know. Uh, <laughs> don't, don't pee in the pool. Don't smoke on an airplane. I <laughs> can pee in the pool, that's fine. Plenty of chlorine. But, uh, <laughs> Can't you? Isn't that fine? Being in a, being in yeah. a pool can't be okay. that big of a problem. All right. Moving on from, from whether or not it's seasonal. Researchers have taken a look, a different kind of look at the Delta variant of the COVID virus, SARS-CoV-2. And um, what they have used to investigate it, as they've published in Science this last week, is what they are calling a viral-like particle. And they are using these viral-like particles to investigate contagious viruses without actually using the whole virus. So what they do is they uh, it contains the virus's proteins, but not the virus's genome. So right. there's no RNA genome. And so the particles can attach to cells. They can start to inject into cells, but they can't infect cells. They can't use cells as, you know, their, it's, their it's photocopier. Right. That's the, basically the two parts to a virus. You have that uh, shell 
And then you've got the little bit of RNA in the side that then, once it gets into a cell, is the thing that takes over that cell's normal system and replicates its DNA and then makes more virus. It's yeah. all white, so, so, no yolk. But this is, yeah, exactly. this is all, yeah, this is all eggshell. <laughs> and how does the eggshell get in there? That's a smart way of doing it. Yeah, and so they created uh, a, a copy of the Delta variant with a, the particular uh, R203M uh, variation. And so, okay, I'll, I'll go back. So they created this particle and then they started playing with it to figure out what aspect of the, the virus-like particle allowed transmissibility. They found that a mutation in Delta's N protein, which is the nucleocapsid protein, which is the protein that encases the virus. Um, it's called R203M. And this particular mutation in the nucleocapsid is the one that allowed increased transmissibility. It increased the amount of RNA from the virus that would make it into host, host cells. And so by looking at this, they mutated it, they tweaked it just a little further, and they found that they could still mutate that nucleocapsid protein further to make it more transmissible. So they weren't messing, this isn't gain of function, they didn't mess with a real yeah. Delta variant SARS-CoV-2 virus, but this virus-like particle that was very, very close to being Delta, they showed that Delta has the possibility of becoming even more, more transmissible mm -hmm. than it is now. Oh, gosh. So what can we do with that information? Run. <laughs> no. Yes, this is a great question, Blair. The, what we can do with this information is that we can use it to design treatments, to design uh, vaccines, to design um, antivirals that target not just the spike protein, but this part of or, or just in general, the nu nucleocapsid. So this N protein of the of the Delta variant we've seen is very important. And that is one that we should be looking at for our future developments of the you know drugs that we use. Yeah, it sounds like a smart system. Yeah. So, you know, the reality is like even if this nucleocapsid, the N protein did mutate further, um, there's there's no like ab absolute promise that it would actually work better in practice in nature because this is just a very specific example in a dish and so we don't know the dynamics of how the vi how it would or if it would actually change transmissibility but in this laboratory dish environment it did work um yeah, so they tested live coronaviruses mutated with this R203M on lung cells and found that these viruses induced the cells to produce 51 times more virions than the original strain oh, of virus. Oh, no, that sounds bad. <laughs> it's really bad. <laughs> you guys, let's you know, get vaccinated, wear your masks, social distance. You know, don't pretend the pandemic's over because it's not and this virus could get worse, but it hasn't yet, so I don't want to panic anybody here, but just... <sighs> Just put it out there. Scientists, please start looking at the nucleocapsid some more and uh, create your your treatments there. We want them. Frumpy, Frumpy B in the uh, chat room is pointing out that uh, Singapore, uh, which has universal health care, they have one pay. says, you don't pay anything for your doctor uh, in Singapore. Yeah. Uh, everything's covered. Uh, they are going to start charging people who are yes. unvaccinated, who go to the hospital with COVID relatable uh, stays, uh, which is a pretty interesting thing. Cause the, the thing that made me think of that story that's out there that they're proposing, made me think of this really interesting Venn diagram of people in the United States who uh, can't be dropped by insurance for a pre-existing condition of having gotten COVID without having gotten vaccinated. And those who are, uh, and, and it's they're they're going to be able to keep their health coverage because of Obamacare, even though politically, these many of these same individuals were totally against the thing that now is going to allow them to not get dropped by their insurance companies for having gotten COVID. So I think that's kind of there's a lot of interesting healthcare related issues uh, and cost of healthcare related issues with the unvaccinated uh, holdouts.
Yeah. Um, but at, there's a story that Fada shared uh, as well, uh, which is that in uh, speaking of the vaccines, though, in France, um, France is recommending that uh, people under 30 men, boys uh, under 30 years of age do not get the Moderna vaccine because of the higher likelihood of myocarditis. And uh, it seems as though there is an even higher likelihood of my myocarditis with Moderna than there is with Pfizer, which is mm -hmm. a concern. But again, if you know that it's within certain age groups, we can manage that. And Blair, though, mm -hmm. don't we have like a whole bunch of other vaccines that are just going to become available really soon? I mean, we've been working on this. Yeah, well, that's uh, there certainly are. But what I wanted to talk about <laughs> was actually the vaccines you should have been taking over the last two years that maybe you didn't because there was a pandemic on. So um, this is a oh, peer reviewed yeah. publication coming out in the American Academy of Family Physicians, reminding everyone that um, there is a severe disruption to routine vaccination services. And so that deficit needs to be uh, recouped quickly or there is the potential for a strain on the already overtaxed health system, and um, there would be dire consequences for future public health. So this is things like, you know, what else is bad besides COVID? Oh, just, you know, measles, mumps, oh, measles. diphtheria, mumps. tetanus, What about polio, that whooping cough? What about that whooping oh cough? I hear that's HPV. terrible. HPV. These are all things that we normally get shots for when we go to the doctor every year. But uh, we haven't been going to the doctor. We haven't been going to the doctor. Right. And honestly, I'm kind of worried about the fact that there were lots of people out there that were told it was time for their annual shots and they got their shots. And now they're going to hear the word vaccine and it's going to be a whole thing. <laughs> so I, I will be interested to see from a sociology standpoint um, mm -hmm. if normal routine inoculations in some cases drop because of yeah. the politiz politicization of such an easy word to say uh, of vaccines <laughs> over is the that, last couple of years is that a yeah. good word i think it's the ignorization sure but it's, yeah, I think it is aligned accurate. with a certain identity is the yeah. issue which is what yeah. that means right so this is part of the like it is feeding into identity politics so that your desire to take proper care of yourself medically is now somehow tied to your value system, which is a strange world that we live in. But I just want to throw out there, if you haven't been to a doctor for a while because of COVID, you're vaccinated against COVID. Hey, guess what? Make an appointment. Go see your doctor. Make sure you're up to date because the flu is still here. The flu. Yeah, if, go get your we flu gotta, shot. We have to watch out for the flu if they're, yeah. Everybody needs yeah, to take care of themselves. Shot, double mask, go to your doctor, get your vaccines. If you don't know if you're due for some other vaccines, send them a message. I know most doctors now receive emails or some sort of secure message system where you can call them on the phone. Find out if you, if you or your loved ones need vaccines and go get them because COVID is not the only vaccine that you need. That's all. That's good. That's good. Thank you. Oh, we need to, there are so many things and we forget because some things are, they're just, they're baked into our routines. And when the routines got messed up, it all, it, it all got messed up. So hopefully we'll get back in those routines again. Everyone will take care of themselves, take care of their communities. Let's work on community immunity and keep moving forward. This is This Week in Science. Thank you for joining us for yet another episode, spending your time with us today. If you are enjoying the show, please head over to twist.org and click on that Patreon button. We really would appreciate your support to keep this show going. The Patreon button takes you to our Patreon community where you are able to choose your level of support, $10 and up per month. You get thanked by name at the end of the show. And we also have calendars available. Let Twist help you keep track of 2022. Head over to twist.org, click on the toad, and order a calendar today. Thank you for your support. We really can't do this without you. We're coming on back. Coming on back. Hey, what time is it, Kiki? 
coming on back. It's This Week in Science, and it is time for Kiki's Jazz Songs. Yeah. Boom. All right, it's time for time that we all wait for. Blair's Animal Corner. With Blair! She loves our creatures, great and small. Biped, milliped, no pet at all. If you want to hear about animals, she's your girl. Except for giant pandas and squirrels. And what you got, Blair? Oh, I have a lovely story about the prehistoric Priapulida, a.k.a. the penis worm. Ugh! Researchers from Durham University and Yunnan University reveal that penis worms, ah! penis Priapulida, invented what we now call the hermit crab lifestyle some 500 million years ago at the rise of the earliest animal ecosystems in the Cambrian period. So just after the Cambrian explosion, the penis worms ah! found a way to take care of themselves amongst all these new predators. Hermit crabs are well known for using snail shells and other shells as shelters against predators. One of my favorite things about them is how they'll actually line up in a row from biggest to smallest and trade up in their um, shells since they are grow out of the shells over time. It's very cute. Um, and well, it turns out that penis worms may have come uh. up with that on their own ahead of time, hundreds of millions of years before the hermit crabs. And this is all discovered because of the Guanshan fossil deposits. These are famous because they preserve some soft tissue. And so there was, uh, there were fossils that had both the bodies of the soft penis worms alongside mm -hmm. a shelly material that made up this specific fossil record. And so um, they found four specimens of these worms, Eximipriapulus, and they were found inside conical shells of hyaliths, which basically just look like ice cream cones. It's really the only way I could describe it. And so they're um, a long extinct fossil group, but they're an invertebrate that lived in these big cone-like shells. And so when they would die, it appears that the penis worms would live <laughs> inside these little ice cream cones. Except so, for the little bit that was melted out of the cone. Yeah. Um, so they're always, uh, in all four cases, they were sitting snugly in those cones um, in the same position and orientation, which led researchers to believe it was intentional. In, of course, after the Cambrian explosion, there were many aggressive, voracious predators, and the soft body of the penis worms would be a perfect uh bite to eat essentially and so they were able to take permanent shelter in these empty shells so they suspect this is the only explanation that made sense based on the orientation of the worms in the shells and that is that they, it was their homes and so this is very cool because um there's this complex ecology developing immediately after the cambrian explosion um it's something that this kind of complex behavior, could do you want to call it tool use? I don't know, you could. Uh, but this is something that uh, you usually consider to be from much younger geological periods, animals that are quote unquote smarter than that. And so uh, this hermiting lifestyle, this is the earliest it has ever been documented, of course, and has um, it has not been directly observed in any living penis worms. So... This is something that it seems like they did very specifically <laughs> during that time. And so that also highlights the remarkable speed and flexibility of evolution. They're it's like, so fascinating. I'm just, I mean, I'm just being a these, worm. I'm just these nice old worms. These, these, yeah, they're soft the bodied. They're, they could be. Oh, eaten. what's that? Better hide. Right. Right. Something's going to eat them. They want to hide. They're, you know, but they're probably not thinking too much, but they probably figured out that these shells, these things were protective. Mm -hmm. Or the ones yeah. that were in them didn't die. 
I mean, there's it's, <laughs> think of, think about like sea cucumbers. They're yeah. they're not you know they're even less evolved, quote unquote, if you want to think about nerve nets and things like that, than worms. And they know to go into areas of tide pool tide pools that are harder to reach. They know that. And hmm. I don't know if it's because of shade or proximity. They can feel it's kind of close in there. There's stuff around them. So there's some sort of sensory information that, that these worms are getting that know they're in a tight, hard space. And that means that they can, they're protected. It's like so they have has... a mind of their own. Yes. Yes. But these, okay, so these are fossil from the, the, the Cambrian, right? So this is millions of years old. Do any of these penis worms hide in or do they act like hermit crabs today mm -mm, none none okay yeah interesting so that that's why they it's so wild it. yeah they yeah. lost it they didn't need it anymore i don't know i don't need a shell i can make it i'm tough yeah yeah and now moving on to fish fish rubbing um so <laughs> this is a study from the university of miami shark research and conservation program at the risen School of Marine and Atmospheric Science, and they looked at fish chafing, which is exactly what it sounds like. It is where it is a cross species behavior where fish rub up against other animals, and in this very specific case, sharks that could eat them. Hmm. So their their research found this was frequent, widespread, and could play a previously unappreciated ecological role in aquatic ecosystems. Uh, it, they examined underwater photos, videos, drone footage, and witness reports and found 47 instances of fish rubbing against shark skin. They were documented in 13 locations around the world and in, they varied in duration from eight seconds to over five minutes. They recorded 12 finned fish chafing against eight different species of shark, including great whites, and in in one case, they documented silky sharks chafing on the head of a whale shark. And the number of fish chafing against sharks ranged, ranged from one to over a hundred. Oh, wow. Time. What is going on here? <laughs> chafing has been well documented between fish and inanimate objects like sand, rocky substrate. But sh chafing against sharks, something that could eat them. Uh, right? but this the sharks is have those wild. amazing have the amazing tooth like skin. Yes, and so, so shark here's skin would be an amazing exfoliator. Uh huh. Is that what's going on? Because if, if uh, anybody who's just listening, what we're seeing is uh, images of whale, uh, sorry, sharks, uh, sort of swimming through the ocean, and these smaller like feed fish. Just like side bumping up against them repeatedly, bump, bump, like bump. Uh, hey buddy, hey buddy, like nudging them. So with the, but so is that what they're doing? Are they exfoliating? That's so great question. Don't know. Would have to do a study where like you removed all the dermal denticles from a shark and then figured out if they still want to do it. But that it seems to be the best reasoning behind what's going on. And so, now the the images you're showing now now mm. it's the sharks. That are doing on a this whale shark. A whale shark. <laughs> yeah, so shark, shark on shark. Yes. Yeah. And so on a whale shark, there's not a lot of uh, risk to it, right? Danger. Yeah. But it, it, anyway, um, but yeah, shark skin covered in dermal denticles, basically skin teeth, and they they have this really rough sandpaper surface. So they their theory, the researchers' theory, is that the chafing actually helps them to remove parasites or other skin irritants and this actually improves fish health and fitness now what's crazy about this though is sharks this is, the loofah of the sea yeah this is which like actually a, that's where loofahs come from never mind <laughs> no they come from <laughs> sponges but that's okay um also an animal but they uh, uh this as far as these researchers know is the only scenario in nature where prey seek out and rub up physically against a predator so think about this right? the yeah. cost benefit analysis of this interaction has to be get eaten or live with parasites i'm gonna risk getting eaten yeah be, okay so it's the yeah the, i've got an itch i can't easier. reach hey bear come here can you get <laughs> can you get my back right or just over the but the behavior that we're watching though it isn't like 
scratch like you take a loofah and you scratch it back and forth and back and forth and back and forth and you you rub your skin and you know you so you have hands you get in there you have hands but the fish are doing these quick bumps they're very mm-hmm. quick they're not sustained they're not like they could you know they could easily manage this mm-hmm. their speed to do some kind of forward backward exfoliating kind of moment this is it's a quick bump it doesn't seem like it would be it needs to be aggressive, maybe. Yeah, to get yeah it doesn't enough, seem like enough. it would be enough to do much. It's hard to get, it's hard to get friction. Yeah, I don't know. I, I, maybe it's hard to get friction underwater. So the <laughs> other <laughs> thing... They have to really kind of... The, the other thing about sharks, which kind of feeds into the conversation I was having with Justin a couple weeks ago about sharks, is that um, sharks get a, a pretty intense bad rap about being these killing machines and, and being very savage, but mm-hmm. they they don't constantly eat and when they're not hungry they don't eat so this is if you're also talking about the law of averages here (laughs) and the chances of being eaten as a fish chafing up against a shark it's out of the whole ocean it's probably not that high and especially if you're doing it in a pack of a hundred your odds are even lower that you're gonna get eaten Right, so, I, and I think the odds are, are outweighed by the need to do it. Like next time you have an itch, wherever the itch is, that's not important. The next time you have an itch, we're like, "Oh, I need to scratch that itch." Don't wait. Just don't. <laughs> Just don't, and see how long you can last without going absolutely psychopathically insane. Well, I'm hoping that the uh, that these researchers might work with physicists or materials engineers to see no, 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 maybe make a better <laughs> loofah yeah no uh, but to to see what kind of forces are going on during the quick fish bumps mm, mm-hmm. and see like what actually could be happening because we can make all sorts of guesses about it but yeah understanding the actual physical forces that are involved and whether or not there's enough going on to really I don't know, affect the skin of the fish in any way. I don't know. Maybe they're resetting their lateral line system. I don't know. Oh, yeah. I mean, that's a great question. I mean, the, the other thing to keep in mind too, is the parasites that live on the skins of fish can be deadly. They can be yes. a big problem. So to Justin's point, it's not even just that if you itch, you got to scratch it. It's that if you don't get rid of that skin parasite, it might kill you before the shark eats you. So <laughs> It's in terms of like the hierarchy of importance, it might be worth the risk. But yeah, Maslow's I think, I think, hierarchy of needs for fish. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So yes, like a scratching post for fish with <laughs> with uh, force sensors on them. I think exactly yeah. would be the next step in research. That sounds great. Uh, any PhD students out there, you're welcome. <laughs> Go to University of Miami, look up this researcher, help them out. This is This Week in Science. Thank you for listening to the show. Thank you for being here. Just another reminder that if you head over to twist.org, our calendars are now available. Click on the toad and order today. All right, Justin, what do you have? Hey, thank me later if you're a future PhD student. Uh, Avoid the University of Miami. Turns out over the past four decades, the time between tropical storms making landfall in the Gulf Coast has been getting shorter and shorter and shorter. Uh, Predictions now by this uh, new research published in AGU Journal Geophysical Research Letters suggest that by the end of the century, Louisiana and Florida will be twice as likely as they are now to experience two tropical storms that make landfall within nine days of each other. This is according to the current model estimates of where we will be with global climate change. More tropical storms have been getting packed into single hurricane seasons already. Stronger hurricanes have been showing up. Uh, This is the season in the the Gulf, uh, southern coast of the United North America which runs from June through November. And the time between them keeps getting closer and closer and closer. Florida and Louisiana, based on their modeling, 
are the most likely to experience sequential landfalls. What's where one hurricane moves over, uh, devastates some infrastructure, does a bunch of flooding, a bunch of people are evacuating, and then within 10 days, it happens again. So part of the problems with that is, of course, there's not then enough time for infrastructure to recover. There's not enough time for uh, things like uh, overflowing water containment areas uh, to rebound. Uh, you have soil that's already saturated with uh, moisture. You have uh, dams or rivers that are already near flooding because, of course, when one of those storms comes in, there's the initial damage of a hurricane hitting a coastal area, but there's an additional flooding and damage and levee breaking uh, problems that occur as that storm moves inland and is filling up reservoirs and raising river levels even after the hurricane has passed the immediate impact zone. So uh, this is according to one of the researchers, uh, Daji G. Uh, if you need 15 days to restore infrastructure, for example, a power system after a storm hits, and the second storm makes landfall before that system can recover, residents will face even more dangerous conditions. So, yeah, this was a study that examined hurricane seasons from 1979 to 2020, focusing on years in which at least two tropical storms made landfall in the same region within two weeks of each other, looked at how that number changed over time, paired that trend with the climate model to estimate how the number of back-to-back -back hurricanes would change over time, broke it down to regions and found Louisiana, Florida, of course, most likely to get hit by this multiple strike event. I'm just imagining how that would affect communities if, you know, you've been hit once and then you don't have time to recover. How much so of... How much of a reserve do you have to be able to exist in a place without power for how long? Um, so just or if in you Texas. have to leave, yeah, or if you have to leave, you leave, and then when do you get to come back? You know, there there yeah. are huge questions for the habitability of these places moving forward long term. Yeah, they had the uh, the uh, Texas had the cold snap and then got hit by a storm. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, which was was trouble. We've had. Uh, Louisiana, I think, got hit by a hurricane, and then a year later, another one. Like, it's just it's the sort of thing that's uh, nature's way of telling you that they're ma it's mad. It's very <laughs> it's, angry. Uh, topography, like we were talking about before, it yeah. could also just be that. <laughs> it's topography. It could also be topography. With the, climate yeah, change. the way things move. Yes, it's obviously the climate change, but the reason <laughs> that there's uneven impacts is because of currents, both air and water, yep. topography. Actually, I don't think, I think nature is specifically angry at both Louisiana <laughs> and, and Florida. Uh, no, it's not angry. It's just like, I didn't really want to give those up. I'd like them back underwater again. Mm. That I mean, they, they were underwater for a very long time. It's not like... You know, yeah, they've been they've been out of the water just for a little bit, and the the water's like, no, 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 I want you back, I want you back. But yeah, this is this it's not just Louisiana and Florida that this is going to potentially be an issue for. I'm sure this is, mm -hmm. you know, just yeah, a general. I mean, specifically those areas, but more generally, low lying coastal regions that are within yeah. hurricane zones are probably going to be very. Uh, likely to succumb to things like this. Yeah, and then it becomes forward. sort of like my, uh, whenever there's a big uh, massive earthquake that devastates Haiti, I always make the point that this is, at this point, a man-made disaster. That you keep trying to right. rebuild someplace that you know is going to get knocked down again. Uh, you know, how many times are you going to rebuild New Orleans? I mean, the beaches, uh, the, the uh, eastern beaches, of southern florida are completely artificial at this point they, yeah maybe florida been... thinks it's smash mouth i don't even oh get knocked down get up i again, get knocked kind of down thing. but i get, up, I get again. up again yeah yeah but Sorry. i'm also Just but, you know, smash mouth. <laughs> that's chumbawamba chumbawamba isn't it thank you no Thanks. i don't know 
Hey, look. Uh, we're having some sort of language difficulty here. There's actually a lot of tools researchers can use to trace the paths of humanity when we look into our ancient past. Yes. Uh, one of the oldest tools we've used is language. Since then, we have all sorts of archaeological, geological tools. There's genetics now. Uh, but they did made a discovery, basically, starting with language, a vast trans-Eurasian language family that consists of Japanese, Korean, Mongolian, and Turkish, which is sort of an interesting, as well as uh, Tungu Isik, which I'm not sure where that is spoken. These are languages that have uh, had now their origins traced back 9,000 years to an to the early farming communities in Northeast China. So until now, uh, researchers had assumed that this language family had uh, originated from Mongolia, because that's a, a sort of Northeastern China. Uh, about 3,000 years ago, this was spoken by horse riding nomads who did keep livestock, but they weren't really farmers, crop farmers. And that these nomads had sort of spread this language uh, around the region. This is Martin Robitz, uh, the Max Planck Institute for Science of Humanity of Human History, and Jenna and her colleagues used linguistic, archaeological, genetic evidence to conclude instead that it was at the onset of millet cultivation by farmers in China that led to the, the origin and spread of this language family. So one of the most important things is we've we've also seen linguistically in places along the that the uh, spice trail, what have you, is where whenever people have to communicate over important things like food and water and trade is where a lot of sharing of language takes place. Uh, and so the advent of agriculture means that you have all of this food being produced and you have this commodity that can now be traded and expanded elsewhere. And so the language uh, around that then develops. Team did their uh, they studied <laughs> linguistic features of languages using computational analysis to map their spread through similarities to each other. That also allowed them to trace proto-trans-Eurasian language back to that Liao River of northeast China around 9,000 years ago, which happened to be the exact same place that domestication of millet was taking place. So, so it's they didn't so much they basically like let's get all the data on the language and things that were going on and it just correlatively in a way all lined up to tell the story you know all these disparate pieces of information that they 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 added up uh told a nice narrative at the spread of this language starting with early uh, cult, uh early uh cultivation around 6500 years yeah. ago they also found descendants of some of these farmers moved eastwards into Korea, where they learned to cultivate rice about 3,300 years ago. And they also found genetic linkages from those people to Japan. Uh, kind of an interesting thing, uh, Robitz here says, we all identify ourselves with language. It's our identity. We often picture ourselves as one culture, one language, one genetic profile. Unless you're American, in which case you know all that's nonsense. Our yeah. study shows that like all populations, those in Asia uh, and elsewhere are mixed. Yeah, it's pretty amazing that they were able to track down to, you know, spread of some pretty big languages down to a handful of farmers 9,000 years ago. Yeah, I think that's like, like when you really take the whole story and put it in that kind of perspective of like the group of people trying to eat to share their wares, to just get along and like, okay, I got to get along with other people. Okay, we got to talk. And so the yeah. language spread and this and the language was shared and, and they moved and eventually it becomes, you know, a language of, of a nation, right? Of a language of a, of a of nation. People. And also a massive uh, human yeah. domestication effort. You yes. know, the, the, yeah. early, the early coinage, some of the oldest coinage that we've ever seen on this planet uh, has farming implements mm. on it because this was the most important thing. Uh, and we began to sort of subdivide human behavior the way that a farmer ran a farm. 
you have the farmer who's in charge of this stock, that stock, the other stock, and they all have to be uh, regulated, treated differently, kept within fences, kept within boundaries. This is the formation of law, is basically farmer fences and how they treated livestock. Like, it explains is... so much about modern society. I mean, really. Yeah, it does. Yeah. <laughs> oh, you animals. What are we going to be up to next? Talk about some brains. Mm -hmm. Brains! Brains! Oh, yes, I brought brains. Well, neurons in brains, really. Uh, there is a study out now that compares human neurons to the neurons of other mammals. Researchers have uh, from MIT have compared human neurons across the mammalian kingdom to originally stemming from an observation in rats that um, that the ion channels in rats versus mice that as the neurons started big they started they started looking at the ion channel density so ion channels are in the membrane of neurons and when an electrochemical signal comes through, the ion channels will open to allow potassium and sodium to move across the membrane, to propagate current flow, to create what we know as the action potential, like the individual electrical signal of uh, the movement of a signal down a neuron. And so ion channels are essential for this happening. They had looked at all sorts of mammals and they're like, oh, damn, ion density, that's great, whatever. But wait, it looks like there's this difference between humans and rats. That's weird. I wonder if this difference between humans and rats holds up against other species. They looked at 10 different other species of mammals and found that as neurons get bigger, the concentration of ion channels in the membrane gets bigger as well. So there's a higher concentration. And the way that this turns out is that if you compare a chunk of brain from a rabbit and a chunk of brain from a shrew, the shrew brain being much tinier than a rabbit's brain, and so it's packed more densely and has smaller neurons in it, essentially what, what ends up happening is that per, for any unit area, any unit volume of brain across these two two animals' brains, they have the same amount of ion channels. So essentially, it's like the neurons work with a, a particular function of the ion channels allow ions to flow and the action potentials to happen. Human neurons have fewer ion channels. Why? What they think, what? Yeah, it's like the only species, human, human neurons, have fewer ion channels. We still have action potentials. Everything works great. In fact, we consider ourselves like the smartest animals on the planet, thanks to all the ion channels in our brainy neurons. So wait, you're saying it so turns out happened? we're the dumbest? Because, <laughs> no, no, because I, I, I literally like I haven't I haven't read this story. I saw the headline and immediately made a biased assumption that it's like, oh, we have uh, more, probably more ion channels than, than the rest of them. We have fewer. More, more. I know, I know, yeah. I know. I just assumed like our brains are like got more whatever the thing is that they're going to talk about because we're like so smart. We have fewer than the rest of all animals. Well, not the rest of all animals. It's like the I mean, the mammals. the trend yeah. was an increasing trend, but our neurons do not follow that trend. Huh. Our our. Like if you were to look like plot a line of like, you know, neuron size to number of ion channels, you'd yeah. see it just an increasing line. But from uh, like you would have humans like be rat, like up at the top end, down. but below the line. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, so what that means is that we have fewer ion channels for any volume of brain material. And the researchers think that what oh. is happening is that because ion channels opening cause this flux of energy, the neurons then have to manage the ions. And so you have these pumps that you have to use ATP, the energy 
molecule for our cells to function. You have to use ATP to pump things back into the cell to keep these ion radiants going so that the neurons can be ready for the next action potential to come along. And to maintain neurons is very, it's energy expensive. Our brains take a lot of energy. So they think that the human neurons came up with some other mechanism to increase efficiency so that they wouldn't have to, so that they get the same amount of electrical transmission, but don't have to spend as much energy to open the, and close those ion channels to allow that potentiation to happen. So can I can I ask some uh, some really? I think it's dumb an questions. energy efficiency thing. Yeah. What? Okay, so I'm going to ask a couple of dumb questions. So based on this model, we don't have as many ion channels as we should have for the volume of our brains, but we know that our brains have grown quite a bit over the last oh couple you know maybe million years or so. So if is so there's probably. If you go back a couple million years to a erectus or a habilis or something, yeah, maybe it kind of matched what was happening with other mammals. But now we have a larger brain mammal, uh, uh, brain volume, yeah, uh, and now we have the same number of channels. So the brain had to, <laughs> biology had to figure out a workaround because we didn't develop the more channels, we just got more volume. Is that what I'm kind of hearing? Right. So the researchers. They have a quote in this article here. We think that humans have evolved out of this building plan that was previously restricting the size of the cortex, and mm -hmm. they figured out a way to become more energetically efficient. So you spend less ATP per volume compared to other species. And that implies that that is what allowed us also to have these larger brains. Because then it makes me think that if you took that ratio and put us back in line with with any other of these mammals, you know, we would be dumber. Be, no, we'd have a much sm <laughs> oh, we'd have a much we'd smaller have a small, brain. Yeah, we'd have yeah. a smaller brain. So I kind of yeah. want to know what the size of that brain is because that's the real human brain size. Then, like that's the one when we're comparing against other mammals. That's actually the size of a brain that we should be using. No, we've got all the neurons. We've got, it's not just like, oh, there's a bunch of, I mean, there's a bunch of fatty tissue in our brains for sure. But uh -huh. it's not like, it, the, we've got neurons. We've got a lot oh, yeah, of neurons. Yeah, yeah. And they're but big I mean, neurons. Are they... They're able to do great things, <laughs> yeah. but they're but more efficient. They... That's the they're thing. They're more efficient. They're more efficient. I, but it's like, I feel like there's probably a judgment center that <laughs> that is not more efficient than yeah. some of the rest of the brain. I have a fan, and that's the size of the brain that probably when anyway. However, that's not what this study was. <laughs> no, that's not what this study was. No, no, there no. Was, that's the study there was that I another make study that study. did find in fish. I think it was in fish that they or it's a study discovering that there you can have individual areas of the brain evolve separately from other areas of the brain. I didn't I wasn't planning to talk about that study tonight, but that's another one. So anyway, you can have evolutionary mosaicism in the brain as well, which is an interesting idea. But the next study that I did want to talk about was um, cool sponge study, sponge cells. Where did our nervous system come from? Sponges, they were the oldest organisms. Super simple, right? Just a it's tube. A, it's a tube, right? It's just a tube and the water goes through it. It's like, and that it's a, does, what, what does it have to communicate about? Well, it, it has lots of, lots of things to communicate about, apparently. So uh, researchers publishing in Science over the last week uh, found that sponges use an intricate cell communication system for feeding regulation. And it also allows them to uh, weed out invading bacteria, which is exciting. Uh, so they are hypo hy hypothesizing that this could help us understand how nervous systems evolved. So understanding that this cell to cell communication was occurring, um, they're able to be able to determine uh, that this could have been a predecessor. If you've got you know, one cell talking into another cell, this may have been that early, early state. Um, they did x-ray imaging, electron mi microscopy, 
They looked at all these cool cells that were filter feeding and doing all this interesting digestive work. They had like 18 different cell types. And they found that there are uh, synaptic genes actually active in some of these cell types. Synaptic, synapses, neurons, zoop, zoop, talking to each other. So there are genes that we're still using today. Genes encoding proteins that usually allow things like synapses to function, which is very cool. Um, and then they determined that the these cell, one of these cell types, they're calling it a secretory neuroid cell. Mm -hmm. We're getting so close to neurons here. It's mm. fascinating. They send out arms, long arms, to grab coanocytes. And these coanocytes drive the water flow systems and help to capture the food. And so these, these neuroid cells reach out and grab onto them. Um, and the expression of the genes and the chemicals, and they think that the, ner the neuroids are talking to the coanocytes and telling the coanocytes what to do to control the water flow, to help with the feeding, to make sure that everything is working the way that it's supposed to. What? Sponges. Yeah, More loofah. complicated than we thought. <laughs> yeah. More interesting than you thought. Yeah. Nice. Yeah. It's very, it was this, very uh, cool. I'm, I'm, I'm starting to Google it, but I couldn't, I can't remember the guy's name. I think it's Sheck, but I uh, totally lost it. Um, but he got, uh, I think, uh, one of them Nobel Prizes for mm -hmm. some work studying the brain. And it turned out the neuron generation, when new neurons are born, that whole system for doing that, that gene, the expression. Neurogenesis. Neurogenesis, thank you. Uh, utilizes the same sort of genetic pathways and similar genes as when a yeast buds. Hmm. I think it's, is it Charlie Shack? I can't remember the guy's name. Everything name. old is new again. Yeah. Like, but I mean, we have Recycling of things. Yeah. We're very much, uh, like you were saying, uh, we tend to separate ourselves from being in the pl of the planet, right? Yeah. As if we're on the planet, but not actually of it. Of it. Uh, we're not <laughs> of, you know? We're on the Earth, but not of. Yeah, we're connected to all these things. And so we're, we're just one of the many, many, many life forms here. My last study. Oh, what was that, Blair? I was just saying that we have a shared ancestor. They're the, they're part of that animal family tree, and so you know that's one of those things that I I try to talk to people about all the time with the marine animals that seem so strange to people: sponges, yeah. corals, jellies. They have they have nerves. They have a nerve net. They the the brain did not come from nowhere. It's all kind of there. And isn't the sponge like our, our oldest common ancestor? I mean, mm -hmm. not the sponge, an ancient sponge. Yes. Yes, exactly. <laughs> it's basically a tube, except there's no there's no out end. In and out is the same hole. But it's like a... Yeah, it's like a tube where one of the tube is stuck. Is stuck on the ground. That's it. Just is it. <laughs> Filters. It would rather the stuff came in the, the front there, but it can accept some things through the side. Has spicules for some reason, little 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 pokey claws. bits. Yeah, and there he is. That's a sponge. That's your great 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 grandpa. Have big fangs, spicules. Yes. All right. My last story for the night has to do with pain, and well, hopefully it will lead to this. This discovery will help us deter discover better treatments for chronic and spontaneous pain. So a lot of people with chronic pain will complain about the like spontaneous shocks of just enormous pain. Uh, it's not the ongoing pain that you may feel, but the these kind of bursts of pain that occur at regular intervals. These researchers publishing in Neuron this last week have determined that one of the things that's probably going on to cause these spontaneous bursts of pain is what's called 
cluster firing. So it's when a group of neurons, a cluster, fire together. This cluster firing in the dorsal root ganglia, which is You've got your spinal cord going down your back and then associated coming out the side of your spinal cord are these dorsal root ganglia. There's there's sets of cell bodies of neurons and they they work to connect your spinal cord to the rest of your body. And this the dorsal, dorsal root ganglia is important, but it's not supposed to get connections from sympathetic nerves. There aren't, there aren't supposed to be sympathetic nerves growing into your dorsal root ganglia, but in the case of this spontaneous pain that occurs, that's what is happening. They have determined that there are, sp there are sympathetic nerve fibers that are growing in to the dorsal root ganglia where they're not supposed to be. And then they seem to be stimulated by stress. So the sympathetic nervous system is associated, we associate it with our fight or flight system. So um, it helps us be ready, get ready to go and do things. The sympathetic nervous system is like, yeah, 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 let's do stuff. Woo woo. We're going to fight. We're going to run. So they think that it could be triggered by stress by anger, by any number of kind of emotional top-down triggers from the brain, they could be coming down and stimulating these wayward sympathetic fibers that have grown into the this root ganglia. And then they all go together and they fire up the dorsal root ganglia, which is then attached to all this other stuff. And then it's like pain in places where you shouldn't be having it. And it it could be strangely like uh sensory triggered stress triggered there could because it's sensory neurons the question is uh you know where the sympathetic neurons i mean where is it coming from but now they have an idea of what's going on and so now can they figure out how to block it how to stop it how to keep this kind of uh pain from being ongoing in their experiment uh the researchers the re researchers say uh, that they were looking at uh, mice and the behaviors the authors measured in mice only happen about eight times an hour. But could you imagine eight times, even as just eight times an hour, just these being racked by, you know, spasms, sets of spasms regularly through the day. Um, yeah, but in mice, they don't, they they can see the spasms, but they don't, they don't, they can't ask the mice what kind of pain they're going through. Yeah. So they don't. <laughs> still one to 10 squeaks. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So uh, the, the corroboration of, of the pain in the mouse model is still limited and um, looking at it in people is definitely where they want to go. Pain. Da, da, da. Maybe we can treat it. <laughs> that would be nice. Yeah. It's, it's, I mean, I, it's tough to be like, that's great. Because it's like, oh, we figured out a step one of many of how to stop it. <laughs> but, yeah, exactly. you know, you can't go anywhere without step one. So I'll take it. Yeah. The the last in, in this, this article on the scientist, the researcher who's involved in the work says, uh, Sympathetic innervation and sprouting could be a way by which physiological, physical, or emotional stress could physically induce pain in those who already have a chronic pain condition. Every time we identify a possible explanation, it starts to deconstruct the stigma that we have associated with some of these pain conditions where people feel like it can't be that bad or it doesn't make any sense. Mm -hmm. It's all in well, your it head. Doesn't... Yeah, but it's mm -hmm. not. It's in your dorsal root ganglion. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it does make sense. <laughs> well, that's in your head. Yeah. It's in your so spine. Is, or is it your spine? Sorry. Yeah. It's on your spinal your spine. cord. Yeah. <laughs> oh, by the way, Randy Sheckman is nice. the geneticist uh, uh, studying uh, neurogenesis that discovered, nice. uh, or somebody in his lab discovered, health discovered, uh, the connection between the yeast budding and. Uh, I had to look it up. I what do I call him? Charlie Sheck? It's Randy Sheckman. Sorry. Randy Sheckman. All right. Yeah. Somebody should Close. go look that up. And and really, if you're if you want to see like an, a, it's on iBiology, 
Uh, he's got his lectures there. It's totally worth looking at because there's a, it, it's a very fascinating genetic wise, wise view of how one of these essential things that make us human versus a lot of other things, our, our ability to generate neurons, is conserved from the simple yeast. One of the simplest life forms that we, you know, utilize uh, is connected on a genetic level for basically how humans are able to be doing this thing where we're talking and you're listening and there's like somebody invented all these things and this communication stuff because all these neurons are like, ah, oh, I've got to do something with all this brain power. And we came up with the way the world is. And it, we have this common ancestor with yeast. So the yeast possible. are to blame. I see. <laughs> <laughs> we have to blame somebody for all of this mess. Can't be us. Good gracious. Oh, this wonderful mess. This has been This Week in Science. Are we done? Did we make it? Mm -hmm. I think we did a tight hundred. <laughs> yeah, we did it. We did. Thanks, everyone, for joining us. It's been a great show. Good times. We love that you're here with us. And... We do hope that you enjoyed the show. Shout outs to Fada. Thank you so much for your help with social media and show notes. Gord, thank you for manning the chat room. Identity4, thank you so much for uh, recording the show. And Rachel, thank you for all of your editing and your assistance. And I would like to thank our Patreon sponsors for their generous support. Thank you too. Kent Northcote, Rick Loveman, Pierre Velazar, Ralphie Figueroa, John Ratnaswamy, Carl Kornfeld, Karen Tazi, Woody M.S., Andre Bassett, Chris Wozniak, Dave Bunn, Vagard, Chef Stad, Hal Snyder, Donathan Stiles, a.k.a. Don Steino, John Lee, Ellie Coffin, Matty Perrin, Gaurav Sharma, Don Munda, Stephen Elberon, Daryl Myshak, Stu Pollock, Andrew Swanson, Fredis 104, Sky Luke, Paul Runovich, Kevin Ridden, Noodles, Jack Brian Carrington, Matt Bass, John Anina Lamb, Grant, John McKee, Greg Riley, Mark Hesseflo, Gene Tellier, Steve Leesman, a.k.a. Zima, Ken Hayes, Howard Tan, Christopher Rappin, Dana Pinnish, Pearson, Richard, Brendan Minish, Johnny Gridley, Kevin Railsback, Rami Day, Flying Out, Christopher Dreyer, RDM, Greg Briggs, John Atwood, Hey, Arizona, Support, Aaron Lieberman for Governor, Rudy Garcia, Dave Wilkinson, Rodney Lewis, Paul Mallory, Sutter, Philip Shane, Kurt Larson, Craig Landon, Mountain Sloth, Jim Pro, Sarah Chavez, Sue Doster, Jason Olds, Dave Neighbor, Eric Knapp, E.O., Kevin Parachan, Aaron Luthen, Steve Bell, Bob Calder, Marjorie, Paul Disney, David Simmerly, Patrick Pecoraro, Tony Steele, Ulysses Adkins, and Jason Roberts. Thank you for all of your support on Patreon. And if you would like to support us on Patreon, make sure to head over to twist.org. For, wait, where am I at? Uh, next oh, week. On next week's show. <laughs> I was like, wait a sec, that's not my cue. Where was a we long silent. There was a, there was a pregnant pause. And I'm like, oh, it must be time for me to say something. But that's not my, it's just, you got more words. On next week's show. We will be back Wednesday, 8 p.m. Pacific time, broadcasting live on our YouTube and Facebook channels, as well as from twist.org slash live. Hey, do you want to listen to us Listen to us as a podcast? Maybe while you uh, practice talking because you can't anymore? Just search for This Week in Science where podcasts are found. If you enjoy the show, you can get your friends to subscribe as well. For more information on anything you've heard here today, show notes and links to stories will be available on our website, www.twist.org. Also, uh, you can avoid signing up for the newsletter by not clicking on a thing there. <laughs> you can contact us directly. Email Kirsten at Kirsten at ThisWeekInScience.com, Justin at TwistMeaning at gmail.com, or me, Blair, at BlairBaz at Twist.org. Just be sure to put Twist, T-W-I-S, in the subject line, or your email will be spam filtered to oblivion by being chafed by a bunch of fish until it is down to a nub. <laughs> you can also hit us up on the Twitter where we are at Twist Science, at Dr. Kiki, at Jackson Fly, and at Blair's Menagerie. We love your feedback. If there's a topic you'd like us to cover or address, a suggestion for an interview, a haiku that comes to you in the night, please let us know. We'll be back here next week, and we hope you'll join us again for more great science news. And if you've learned anything from the show, remember. It's all in your head. This week in science. This week in science.
science. This week in science. This week in science, it's the end of the world. So I'm setting up shop, got my banner unfurled. It says the scientist is in, I'm gonna sell my advice. Show them how to stop the robots with a simple device. I'll reverse global warming with a wave of my hand. And all it'll cost you is a couple of grand. Cause this week science is coming your way. So everybody listen to what I say. I use the scientific method for all that it's worth. And I'll broadcast my opinion all over the earth. Cause it's this week in science. This week in science. This week in science. 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 This week in science. This week in science. This week in science. 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 I've got one disclaimer and it shouldn't be news. That what I say may not represent your views. But I've done the calculations and I've got a plan. If you listen to the science. This week in science. This week in science. This week in science. <laughs> oh, I muted. Uh huh. <laughs> yep, you said it. Ah, oh, Blair, you're looking at me funny. <laughs> This week in science. This week in science. We've this made it to science. the end of another episode. Thank you all. Thank you. Ah, Gaurav would like us to cover more LGBTQIA plus science, please. When there are stories that we find. Yes, sure. That sounds great. Thank you for being here. Here. I can't talk either. And obviously I am having I was having a hard time remembering to mix the visual elements also. I'm like, I'm just gonna leave that up there. Turn that I forgot. Off. This That's... is this is the part of the show where I get to sit. Oh. Where you get to sit. That's nice. We're gonna watch Blair slowly <laughs> move downward. Yes, to the chair height. There it is. If I would do that, I have to like move the chair. Then I put the camera down. It's all, it's all. So, you know, you do what you must. I'll do what I can. That's do what, what you I must. Do. do what you can. Yes. Bibbidi boo. Bibbidi bam. Bibbidi boppity. Bibbidi boppity. Boo! Yeah. I hope some things stick in my brain too. Frumpy, br frumpy bee working <laughs> on it. Brimpy bream. <laughs> I like bree. Frimmer me. Frimmer me. Frimmer me. Remember me. Oh, good night, Fada. Uh, apparently, according to science, we should all be going to bed between 10 and 11 p.m. Did you no. see that? <laughs> <laughs> no. Um, is that assuming that you don't wake up at five like I do? Because no. <laughs> no. Mm -mm. <laughs> Uh, Gotta tell you, mm -mm. <laughs> earlier than that, yes. Golda yes. Zader says, I'm up at 1 a.m. Oh, Gord agrees. I thought you stayed up very late. Oh, yes, it's always between ha 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 ha. Gord's trickery. Gord agrees with me because it's always between 11 and p 11, 10 and 11 p.m. somewhere. Okay. Okay. It is. We live on a twenty-four Waka, waka, hour waka, planet. waka, you know? Waka, 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 waka. Ba dum bing Ba dum bing indeed. <laughs> you said it. Yes. Yeah, what was it? So, 
two studies this week that I did not like at all. Um, mm -hmm. One, and they're both kind of about sleep. The the one, so, yes, here we go. The bedtime between 10 and 11 p.m. could lower your risk of cardiovascular disease. Keeps you healthy. But then if you sleep more than six and a half hours a night, you're going to have a greater risk of dementia, apparently. More than how many? Six? Six. Six and a half. Man! <laughs> or are they... See, the, I don't... Okay. But... <laughs> no, I just think I don't think I majority, agree with these studies. <laughs> yeah, would you agree that the majority of the population sleep more than six hours a night on average, or at least would report it in self-reporting? No. no, I think I think the majority of the population would self-report that they sleep more than six hours a night. Um, and therefore, if We've been told forever likely, we're supposed to get eight hours a night. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. That so, we're supposed to. I mean, most so people, I think the average is like seven or seven and a half, but. Exactly. So the majority yeah. of people are going to report that they get more than six <laughs> hours, right? So the yeah, odds the of finding a person that sleeps more than six hours is higher. Therefore, propensity of dementia will be higher. Mm -hmm. Huh? It's like yes. you're picking from. A giant swimming pool versus a measuring cup of water. <laughs> and you're saying, oh, man, there's some junk in here. But there's no junk in the measuring cup. <laughs> it's because your sample size is so different. Does this mean we can get rid of yeah. daylight I savings? I didn't bring... What? No, it's it, maybe these studies came out <laughs> timed to publish around daylight savings. Perhaps. But... Uh, let's see. Uh, research, Washington University School of Medicine, wanted to know how much sleep was linked to cognitive impairment over time. Looked at 100 older adults. Okay. I there think their go. sample size is too small. That No, that's it. That's it, though. <laughs> that, the sample size is fine. It's the older adults, the retired mm -hmm. folk who are sleeping more. Oh, gosh, they have more dementia than we've seen in the studies where we studied people who are like... Working two jobs and are no, no, in their twenties. No, 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 okay. okay, no, no, no. Here they go. Okay, so what they did? <laughs> you're making assumptions. Uh, I am. A <laughs> hundred older adults in their mid to late seventies tracked them for between four and five years. During the study, eighty-eight people did not show any signs of dementia. Twelve showed signs of cognitive impairment. One with mild dementia. Eleven with pre-dementia stage. And they did a lot of tests over those four to five years. Then they had a preclinical Alzheimer cognitive composite score. Uh, and they found, what did they find? Sleep was only measured at one period during the study. Okay. Uh, and the researchers say this is indicative of their normal sleep habits. Right. Um, Anyway, what they say is they found that sleeping less than four and a half hours and more than six and a half hours a night was associated with cognitive decline over time. Interesting. So, and this it, is not <clears throat> what we've heard for years and years and years well, and years. I think they, I think they have uh, study problems. But. Yeah, but there's also just uh, uh, we need a genetic survey and all this other stuff involved with this. So the there is such a thing as uh, I think they're called super sleepers. I don't even know what the, what the term is that was used, but there's people who who get on average like that four and a half hours of sleep and are completely refreshed. Yes, and I know people like that, and I, I've met I, people like that. But we we talked about. I think you might have brought the study. I might have brought the study. Blair might have brought the study. Probably nobody else. That that <laughs> that looked at. That looked at these people and thought that maybe their brains were more efficient at taking out the trash. Yeah. That they actually were getting restorative sleep in these shorter yeah. durations. So, you know, like, there's too much disparate information that we already uh, have out there to make a blanket statement about sleep in humans. Humans do need sleep, however. This is a thing that if you if you've been not sleeping well at night, you're cognitively going to be declining over time if you didn't right. get enough. But and enough so that it's, 
might quality. be four and a half hours. Enough might be right. eight and a half hours. It's going right. to depend on your brain more yes. than mm -hmm. yeah. Anything. Yeah, and if you're getting so if you're getting that restorative slow wave sleep that you're supposed to get, if you're getting in that the deep, yeah. the deep cycles. Um, yeah, you're going to have it, and you're sleeping. You're getting restorative sleep. You're and you sleep the right amount, you know, you're right. And you're the not point, and have that, the cognitive impairment. Yeah, exactly. And the point is you can, there, there's people who do that in four and a half hours and there's people who will sleep eight and a half hours and never get it. Yeah. It, it, the sleep that studies. me are, the last few days. I thought I was sleeping. Then I wake up and I'm like, I'm so tired. Why am I so yeah. tired? And now I'm having like impairments. I can't we should speak. find it. We should I find can't a... play this. I can't play the Streamyard producer very well. I'm like blah blah blurb. Should find somebody who does study this uh, on that neurological. I'm very curious because yeah. there is there uh, there are uh, amazing s correlations between sleep and a myriad of health issues, uh, yeah. where you know people who get restorative sleep tend to have a lot less health issues throughout the human uh, anatomy. Yeah. I mean, and there's a difference between oversleeping on a, or, or getting, quote unquote, too much sleep on a regular basis where perhaps you're sleeping for a period of weeks to months uh, longer than the eight, nine hours. That's a your, long time. Know. That's a coma. What are you talking but about? But if <laughs> her night, or months. not the whole. Oh. Not the, <laughs> and so if you're sleeping a lot, like excessive amounts every day, then that's mm -hmm. probably indicative of a problem where you're not getting the restorative sleep that you need. And so perhaps that's lengthening the amount of sleep. Maybe it's indicative of mental health issues mm -hmm. like depression and other aspects. So anxiety could, um, be, yeah. could and, yeah. be oxygenation. Issues, could be oxygenation like if you're not breathing. Need sleep yeah. paps or what do they call I, uh, I discovered. Yeah. It's, I went. If um, it's a day or two, though, then it's fine. You might be making up for last lack of sleep. Yeah. Yeah. I went for like a week, right? And I was like, I was feeling like I was not getting any good sleep at all. And remember, um, Brian works at night, so I sleep alone most nights. And so this was during his long week, so I was sleeping alone for like five nights in a row. I was getting terrible sleep. I was not feeling any good. And then the first night that he had off and we were in the same bed, he was like, he kept waking me up because I stopped breathing. <laughs> and so Sleep I found apnea. out. So it was because I had this, this pillow. I like really flat pillows, but the pillow had gotten so flat that every time I rolled over on my back, I was doing this. <laughs> oh no. <laughs> oh no. And like not breathing. And so I got a new pillow and oh all of a sudden, everything's better. Wow! Sleep again. Mm -hmm. That's that's. And freaky. if you if it you would scary. like if you would like one of these pillows, just go to <laughs> Blairspillow.com. We're Blair. No. <laughs> um, no, but it is a problem because I'm I'm a st I fall asleep on my stomach, so I get yeah. the th the like most yeah. thin pillows that they have i get the ones for stomach sleepers but it mm -hmm. means that they break down much faster and end up yeah. super flat so i have to replace my pillow now i'm finding mm -hmm. in my you know old age we'll say um i am finding out that uh now all of a sudden i have to replace pillows like every few months because otherwise i will have this problem where i like can't breathe when i lay over on my but back. you're saying all of a oh sudden but, but from what you're also telling me uh it's very rare that you have an observer present because of the work schedule it's because because here's the thing he's off the ground at work yeah yeah here's the thing i i have uh never snored unless uh i have an observer <laughs> apparently With schrodinger's nose i get it kind of like that like like i if i found out that i snore mm -hmm. at night and apparently it's not horrible but it's yeah. present no, I, I snore. But I, snore didn't, <laughs> I didn't know because I never heard it Yeah. until until there was an observer. Well, that's the thing. I mean, I can tell now if I have problems um, breathing on a given night because I'll wake up with a headache and feel like I didn't sleep well. I'll be like, oh, time for a new pillow. <laughs> it, it fixes it. It's mm. pretty wild. It's, I could, honestly, I could probably at this point, I could wear a CPAP machine if I wanted to, I bet. 
But yeah, I, I actually uh, <laughs> got one. I actually got one, but I can't, like, I uh, apparently uh, move around mm-hmm. a lot yeah. in my sleep. Me and too. It's, and I can, I, the CPAP has never made it more than, like, an hour of actually sleeping before I've, like, ripped it off and had to you know, throw the thing overboard because it just uh, gets in the way too much. But... Hmm. Yeah. There you go. Anyway, sleep. We don't get it. It's magic. No. <laughs> we try to get it. We try we don't we work. don't get it, and we don't get it. It's just magic. It's you you go into a dreamland for a third of your life, and you don't know what's happening there except for good those for odd dreams that you remember. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Sometimes you predict the future, or do you? Who knows? Yeah. Oh, Want to live longer? Just sleep like, less. Yeah, Gorov did not like lucid dreaming. Oh, I like lucid dreaming. Uh, It's actually, it's annoying. It can be annoying too. Because if you're having a really good dream and you lucid dream in the middle of it, go, oh, this is a really good dream. I'm going to pay attention. I kind of ruin the But if you're lucid dreaming, that means that you are in a very, very shallow sleep state. Oh, then I'm never sleeping properly then. Yeah, but it's also, it's, it could mean that you've come... Either you you're napping or and you're just hitting just falling asleep and kind of hitting that kind of REM cycle stuff right off the bat, or you've gone into a deep sleep and you're on your way out and you're because of the way you have trained yourself to dream, right? You can you can address it lucidly if you're awake enough. Yeah. Right, grouchy gamer. Most people we wake up when they're starting a lucid dream. It's because you're very, very, you're not like, you're right at the edge of consciousness. And that might be where I dream. I mean, that may be where all my dreams that are rememberable happen then. Because uh, I can't have a scary dream, like a proper scary dream nightmare kind of a thing. Because I'll just be like, ah, I don't like it. Let's change this scenario. And so I just, I can fix it like really quick. But that might then indicate that I'm... That when when uh, when dreams form memories, that's an interesting subject. When dreams mm-hmm. form memories, is it an only only in that borderline? Like, is the deeper sleep uh, unimaginable, unaccessed? The that the deep dreaming states of REM is that actually unaccessible to a a next uh, a, a upon awaking working memory of of recall? Is it just yeah. that in between state? Because you know, people will remember dreams that they just woke up from. Mm-hmm. Right. But do you, but remember you don't the remember whole this stuff from, scenario yeah, of dreams? Yeah. 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 But it's also that all that stuff that happened, like it's happening part of it's replaying things and predicting things and mm-hmm. working through stuff, but it's not doing it in a way that is connected to the whole system that creates new memories, really. Like it's part of it, but. Yeah, and our, remember, and remember and remember, you have to sleep for your brain to really process your memories. Mm-hmm. So, having having a bit of sleep, and if you're sleeping when you're dreaming, like the, the when are you going to process your your dream memories? <laughs> if you're already sleeping, <laughs> this is like that downward spiral. When is that ever going to happen? You have to dream again to be like dream, dream, and then so to have that as the dream and the memory, and like it just layers on layers. Hey, question. What? Uh, the uh, do you okay? Two of you, do you uh, remember dreams from time to time to time? Some, t- not rarely. Rarely, okay. Kiki, when do I dream? I remember them sometimes. I pretty much mm-hmm. remember every 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 morning, at least the last dream. And sometimes I can if like I... throw back a little further to an earlier dream in there. But here's it the next question. If I, it depends on if I focus on it or not. Like if I like stop and like really focus as I'm waking up on yeah. the dream and the things that have been in it, then I'll remember it. But yeah, yeah. Sometimes it have I'm to like, be something noteworthy. Make it go away. I don't care. Nonsense. It doesn't count. So, so uh, of the dreams you remember, are you tied to the laws of physics or not? Like, can you fly in a dream? I don't think I've ever flown in a dream. But yeah, you know what? Fly. You know what? What yeah, often happens either. in my dreams is I will go to try to, like, punch somebody if I'm being chased or something like that, mm. and it's basically like nothing. Oh no! 
there's no weight behind the fist at all. It's like mushy. Or I'll go to speak and I can't speak. Oh, I can't read in a dream. I cannot read text in a dream. It is the most annoying thing. Like there's always at some point in a dream I was like, oh, here, read this thing. I'm like, oh, and then I can tell it's the dream because it's all gobbledygooky. Although I have had a few times when I was having a really cool dream and I wanted to uh, share it. And so in the dream, I took a picture of the dream with my phone. And then I was trying to send the uh, picture to somebody, but my phone was just gobbledygook nonsense on the screen. I couldn't, and I realized like, oh, you can't send a text out of a dream yet. That's uh-huh. annoying. Cause this is a really cool dream. I was like, I want to remember this. I was thinking I was just even trying to text it to myself. So I'd have it later. And then I was like, oh yeah, this, this is not how this works. No. Yet. Yet. But I was gonna tell you, I was gonna tell a story. So I can't fly into dreams. Uh, dreams to me, are, all the laws of physics are in place as, as much as I'm aware of them, at least I suppose. Uh, but I had this really weird dream where instead of flying, I was able to walk upstairs in the in open air, and somehow this fooled the dream. Like there was no stairs there in the dream, but as long as I was pretending that there were stairs there consciously, like, I'm just going to keep pretending that there's a next step. I was able to like, doo, 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 doo. I was like, really cool. That was kind of a, a exciting. Uh, breaking the laws of physics dream. Like one of the first time, big, big change. Although in my dreams, I can always jump down from any height. Like <laughs> the gravity, like it doesn't affect, like I can jump down and just sort of land. Like I jumped off of a, a chair. It was like the most, even from a great height. But can't go, can't fly up the same way. Man, I feel like my dreams, they're never, they're not often fun. The ones Ooh. I remember are always the bummers. Oh. They're like, it's frustrating. Well, maybe it's the adrenaline that, uh, in that dream, that's getting you into the near wake state that allows you to remember it. Yeah. Mm. Maybe you have plenty like of that. great dreams. You just don't remember them because, uh, you know, your adrenaline isn't going. I like the dreams, um, the ones I remember or the ones that I like for lucid kind of dreaming. It's always like a, it's like a, all of a sudden I feel like I'm in a movie or a, in a story and I have to, I'm like, wait a minute. I don't like what those people just said. We're going to rewind and we're going to try that over again. Take two. Yeah. <laughs> so I'm like, no, no, yeah. this is the way the story is going to go. And so then exactly. we do it that way. And I'm That's like, oh, I like this. Dream. I like this much better. <laughs> and so I'm like, this is a story I'm telling, <laughs> but it's never, it's never like a, Oh, let's go fly or let's go jump or anything like that. It's always storytelling. Yeah, there's a tremendous like, amount of yeah. narrative stuff that goes Narrative, on. plot-driven, mm-hmm. character development. <laughs> I wonder if there's an interesting relationship to, um, you know, that story that the whole internet went crazy over where some people have inner monologues and some people think in pictures and stuff. Um, well, well, I don't know. Hang on, hang on. So, so Am I mixing yeah. two stories together? No, 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 no. So there is that. There is, there's the... We say the word apple. I've got that same green apple always. I see the images. Da, 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 da. Mm-hmm. Kiki sees words. And then there's people who have the internal dialogue, the running like narrative blah, 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 going on. That's me. I got that. I think we all did have that. And then there's some people who don't have an internal monologue. What I never got answered in that scenario is do the non inter monologue people have a series of images? So like, Okay, I'm thinking to myself, gosh, I'm gonna go over to the cafe, I'm gonna get a cup of coffee, maybe I'm gonna do, yeah, I'm gonna bring my computer, I might sit there on the Wi-Fi for a little bit because they you know, search the internet while I drink my coffee because I get food. All this is words, right, running through my head. Mm-hmm. Does the person without the inner monologue pictures themselves at the cafe? Picture themselves with the computer? That's the part I didn't get under. Uh, so uh, tr- my understanding of it was um, they didn't go into what they pictured, but it was right. basically just like cafe coffee. But is it so word? Not... Is it image? Is it like, the, how is the, that a the, concept? I don't think the study talked about that. The study yeah. just talked about the fact that it was concepts, not complete sentences. Yeah. yeah. Um, but, you know, as a person who is constantly running through a to-do list in my brain at all moments, I'm a narrative person. Mm-hmm. <laughs> but, but yeah, I'm kind of curious if... I was thinking more about that first study about the pictures versus the words. 
if mm-hmm. there's an if there's a link between people that dream more or dream in particular ways based on how their brain works when they're awake. If they're a more visual person, do they dream more? Um, right. I don't, I've, I don't know. I feel like my dreams are fairly visual and there's a lot going on. It's, you know, always wackadoodle, psychedelic type, type stuff, you know, but it's it's yeah, it's rarely a green apple. <laughs> But but it's very visual. So here's Um, a great question that now has occurred to me to ask you, because you are one of those uh, humans who sees the word. Yes. Which also is, by the way, it's cheating when there's a spelling bee. This is why I suck at spelling. I don't. I see the picture of an apple. How do you spell? I don't know what the letters are. You see the the letters. You see the letters. (laughs) Yeah. Uh, Can you read in a dream? Oh, that's a great question. I don't know. I can't answer that question offhand, but I will see if if I ever do, I will try and remember it so I can report back. Try to remember and report that back. Not to ruin ruin this for you, Justin, but I am a pictures person when I picture Mm -hmm. things, but I can read in dreams. And the reason I can tell you that I can is because... There is a very particular episode of Batman the Animated Series that I saw when I was younger where he figured out he was in a dream um, from the scarecrow because he couldn't read. And so, like, my whole life, I thought that was a thing. You can't read in dreams. And then I read in a dream, and I was like, did Batman lie to me? And I, like, started (laughs) doing this research, and I figured all this stuff out. That's wild. So you can read in a dream, but you think in images. I cannot. Yeah. Well, I, I actually, I, uh, I see text. I do see text, but it moves. It keeps, it stays in motion uh, in a weird way that like, uh, it just, it's, it won't it's like settle in on letters. It just refuses to. Uh, but you, but Ooh, I, but I, I think it was the Mad Hatter, not the Scarecrow. Uh, this is going to, Oh, this is gonna get me. I gotta figure it out. I would think it would be the Riddler, but uh, no, no, it's yeah. not the. No, he works in riddles, my man. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> but what's uh, what's it? Here, solve this riddle. I can't. It's nonsense. Ah, oh, shoot. This you must be dreaming. Otherwise, I would have been able. No, to... no, 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 no. The Mad Hatter sounds like a good. It, I think it's the Mad Hatter. But what is the chat? Is this chat room helping me? No, the chat room's not. Helping oh, me. Guav Sharma. I can read in dreams. I read banners and billboards. Mm-hmm. Every no, 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 it's Batman. Batman, the animated series. Bruce Wayne is trapped in a dream. He's not Batman. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And he can't no, but prove who's it doing until it? he opens a newspaper, sees nothing but random symbols. Yeah, right. That's so but much who, what it's but like. But who's doing it? Is it Scarecrow or the Mad Hatter? Well, he's a dream. He's dreaming. It doesn't matter who no, the but bad somebody guy is. Put he invented him, him. Somebody put him in a dream. That was the point. Oh. Is that he was, he was oh. trapped in that dream. What's the name of the episode? Does it say? Uh, it says Scarecrow is the one who uses nightmare stuff. Gord uh, McLeod yeah. says from the chat room, so maybe that's the yeah, that was Scarecrow. a good first answer. I'm just confused because you just started talking about Wizard of Oz and Alice in Wonderland in reference to Batman. Yes, yeah, <laughs> they Batman stole. Has the best villain. They stole from. <laughs> he just stole from everything. Wait, wait a minute. <laughs> yeah. Hey, does anybody know? For chance know... to dream is the name of the episode. For chance mm. to dream, that sounds like a Mad Hatter thing. Um, it sounds like Shakespeare, actually. Oh, okay. Hamlet. Hey, That's come Hamlet. On with this. Boy, they stole. Man, is that all? Is it turning out like Batman is just oh, straight boy. plagiarism for Welcome everything? Welcome to comic books. <laughs> uh, um. Uh, yeah, uh, who was saying it? Uh, Gord. Yeah, uh, the all Mad my Hatter. dreams are in color. It's the Mad Hatter. It the is. Mad it's Hatter. Text. There you go. <laughs> Question answered. I figured it out. Sorry, this is very important. We may all proceed. <laughs> yeah. How about that? Is uh, black and white or color for the dreams? Oh, well, Blair, never mind. Kiki. Color, for sure. <laughs> Actually, Blair, now I'm even more interested to come to think of it. For a colorblind person, do you dream in in colorblindness? Oh, gosh, that's crazy. You don't know. Uh -uh. That's wild. I think color. 
You don't know. No. You don't. That's when. That's wild. You so don't here, know. Here's part of the thing, though. Like my brain doesn't value that information very well. So okay. Um. This this is part of the 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 weird like byproduct of my colorblindness is that I have terrible memories for color unless um it has been identified, and then I have a really good memory. So like if if some if I find out I've been wearing this one piece of clothing and I thought mm. it was black and it turns out it's blue and and I find that. I will always remember that that thing was blue, right? Mm -hmm. um, but uh, my brain doesn't doesn't value the information in the everyday. So, like, if you ask me what color somebody's shirt was on a particular day, where other people might have noticed, my brain doesn't file that information away. It like ditches it as superfluous because it's unreliable. Um, mm. And I think that I take that kind of approach with a lot of things is just probably why that's true for my dreams too is i i don't know because it's not valuable information yeah i had a dream once where yeah. i had uh i think orange socks and all i remembered from the dream was i had orange socks and i was very happy <laughs> and then i woke up and i didn't have orange socks and then my friend uh Jeannie mckendry bought me a pair of orange socks because i told her about Jeannie. this dream Jeannie bought me a pair of orange He's socks i was like ah it's and I wear oh, these socks, and I was happy every time because it reminded me of this happy dream. But it's also well, maybe gotta, your whole dream was black and white, except for the orange socks. It could have been possible. like, could have been, could have been. But so I no, I really definitely the information, right? I definitely dream in color. That that's yeah. that's for sure. But maybe not always. Maybe it's not possible always. not always. Maybe. Uh, no, it's not. Actually, it's not. Uh, like every, or like Gord says, every dream he remembers is in color, and maybe that's the same for me. I don't remember a dream that wasn't in color. Um, also, I have a whole lot of dreams where I'm looking for a bathroom. Mm -hmm. You ever get Love that it. one? Mm -hmm. But the no, bath actually. So the one oh, that I geez. get all the time mm -hmm. is, and this is when you know I have to pee in real life, so I'm like yeah, yeah. avoiding yeah, yeah. getting this is what up. We're talking about. Um, yeah. But it almost always, this is like, this probably is some weird insight into psychological issues, but it almost always is me looking for a bathroom, finding a bathroom and discovering that in this broken. universe, no, yeah. in this universe or alternate reality that my dream is in, stall doors don't exist. Okay. okay. So I just have to, sometimes so, there's not even a bathroom door. I just have to, there's just a toilet in the but, middle of a room and I have to pee in front of everyone. See, that's enough to dissuade you from doing it. Mine is I go there no, and not. I gotta pee. Oh, so my oh, then you're peeing the bed because my in my dreams no, I no. finally I finally find the restroom uh -huh. because I've had to pee and so my and I'm like okay, well whatever's going on in this dream, y'all, yeah, I'm gonna go down the hallway, around the corner, down through a dungeon where there's people getting tortured, up the elevator to another room where and then finally I find the the bathroom in this dream complex. And it's malfunctioning. And it's oh, it's okay. either like been uh, designed by Dr. Seuss on a, uh, with a fever <laughs> where like nothing is really like function or things are like overflowing and it's terrible. It's like there's always something completely wrong with the restroom that makes me have to keep going and looking for another restroom mm -hmm. because part of my brain's like, no, 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 <laughs> no, no, no. You, you, uh, I can't let you do this. I can't explain why. I can't just tell you, hey, wake up, you gotta go pee. Well, that would be really efficient. If the brain was like, wake up, go get up, go to the bathroom. Instead, I keep having to search through dreamland for all these broken restrooms or these weird tiered fountainy urinals that can't even, you know, be reached in a, <laughs> in a, in a reasonable way. All I know is that this, we had, you know, you're, when you're, potty training your children you teach them if they have to pee in their dream wake up and go to the bathroom <laughs> like in the bathroom because usually usually it means you drank too much water before you went to sleep yeah <laughs> yeah, yeah that's how these dreams happen blair uh. right yeah, you would be afraid gamer. of the bed i know says i've never peed in a dream yeah me neither that's it's 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 part of the, and this is the this is like this is one of the great examples Don't of the it. power of the brain without our conscious involvement you know 
The brain is just like, I'm not going to let you do this. Some part, some aspect, some rational part of the brain is like, nope. I don't know you what's going on with me, but I pee in my dreams all the time. Do you It does you not really? affect the real life at all. Really? Yeah. That's cr- Okay. But then do you no longer need to pee or do you go pee and, be, and then you're like, Oh, I still got to go more? No, it usually resolves in the dream. Like, I'm good after that. Wow. It's I think that's... I think it's because my, my baseline that's... is having to pee in real life. <laughs> is I always have to pee. <laughs> so I think my body's just used to having to pee. It's just like, yep. That's just, <sighs> that's just existing. So that's good. If, if anybody's still listening. <laughs> if anyone hasn't peed yet. Yeah, if anybody has it, all this... <laughs> Talk of peeing and I sleep. We have a half an hour still until uh, until it's too late for us. Mm. <laughs> and, I disagree. And cardiac, <laughs> and cardiac disease kicks in, according oh, to the boy. latest studies. Yeah. But what if you wake up at five? <laughs> no, Blair. Between ten and eleven, that is when you have to go to bed. <laughs> That's what science says. <laughs> Uh, Crash Alito, the uh, series Evil. At least that's what the headline uh, said. <laughs> the psychologist tapes a message on her ceiling that says, Can you read this in order to make sure that the night terror demon that's chasing her is just part of the dream? The justification being she can't read text in a dream based on actual psych study. Yes, that's, uh, that's how I always know in a dream that everything's fine. It's just a dream is I pull out my phone and I tried to read a text message and it, if it doesn't work, I, it's just a dream. Okay, I'll go fight the dragon. I won't run away anymore. What's the point? Okay, so this is interesting. So I did a quick Google and it's saying that the idea behind not being able to read in dreams is that when we sleep, the language area of the brain is less active, making reading, writing, and even speaking very rare in dreams. So I have trouble speaking in dreams. So that makes sense. Oh, interesting. Um. Some people share language processing abilities across both hemispheres, and some people even concentrated on the right side. So that would be that would be the guess then, right? Is that if you have if you have language processing across hemispheres, then you should be able to do some things in dreams that other people can't. So there you go. Hmm. Who'd have thunk it? Somebody yeah. did. Yep, 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 yep. I'm trying to make uh, mammoth socks now. Oh. <laughs> Enjoy. I'm like, maybe I can make socks for Zazzle. Why don't we have socks? They have mm. socks on Zazzle? Yes. Ooh. I don't know how good they are. By the way, uh, those twist leggings are awful. <laughs> oh, no. Oh. <laughs> did, you, did you take them down from the site? Uh, I might have. <laughs> I don't want anyone That's to buy them. That's good to know. Like, Can you send us terrible. a picture? We're such a, you know what? This show, if yeah. all, all of our attempts, it's like, hey, ladies and gentlemen, we've got a lot of uh, merchandise. Don't buy any of it. It's all made by slave <laughs> no, so labor really in a foreign good. country, and it's really terrible. It's the itchy. The mouse pads are excellent. It's full, yeah, but they're full of PFAS. You know, uh, the boat towel yeah. is fantastic. I love it. Uh, whatever you the do, don't buy shower. anything that we try to sell you. Please. The doormat has gotten Please. great reviews. Don't buy anything yes. that Maybe we sell. Maybe I'll buy you. some face masks. I need to re-up my Wait, face what is, mask. You know, except for the calendar. The calendars are awesome. I don't know. The um, y- yeah, we right have now. to order those right now, actually. Gord <laughs> is saying, uh, that's an interesting one. Okay. So Gord's talking about, you know those uh, images where test, yeah. that's either a candlestick <laughs> or two people kissing or whatever, the, it's, uh, the old lady and the young lady. Uh, so yeah, for me, they switch back and forth. And I can do it really quick. Like, okay, I want to see, I can say, I want to see the candlestick. Boom, there it is. I want to see the people kissing. Boom, there it is. Gord, Gord on his default mode can actually see both. Interesting. I have a hard time doing the see both thing. I don't think I can do that. The one that freaks me out is that old lady, young lady. The like old haggard oh, yeah, looking like witch how lady. About bird, uh, how about duck bunny? Duck bunny is another one. Yeah, that one's annoying. I like the duck bunny. 
Because they will, they'll like flip like back and forth. <laughs> they'll flip back and forth uh, on me. But I, yeah, what Gord is talking about, being able to hold two balanced uh, at the same time, I've, I do not have this cognitive ability. We'll see. I'm doing twist socks. All right. Oh, is I'm it time to this. say goodnight, Blair? Shall, shall, yeah, shall we? I think it is. Is it that time? Goodnight, Blair. Say goodnight, Justin. Goodnight, Justin. <gasps> goodnight. Kiki. <laughs> <laughs> Night, everyone. I hope you sleep well after all this dreamy talk that we've had. I hope you have another wonderful week full of curiosity and curious thoughts and, you know, just all the sciencey goodness you can handle. We'll try to read in a dream. Week. Try to read in yeah. a dream. Email me. Remember uh, your dreams. If you can read in a dream, email me, twistminion at gmail.com. Let me know if you can read in your dream it's like such a fast i've never been able to do this thing dream reader sorry i will not sing other remakes of songs yes twist is awesome thank you lauren gifford over on facebook uh -huh. Woohoo! we're here we'll be back next week thank you all so much order your calendars please the winter is coming Get your calendars now. Thanks so much. We'll see you. Goodbye. Until next time.